Preface for England in the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. England in the Middle Ages by Elizabeth O'Neill. Preface the period from the norman conquest to the end of the fifteenth century may be conveniently and aptly named medieval rich and varied as were the phases of its life it has a certain homogeneity which marks it clearly off from the days before the conquest and from the tudor period differ as might the england of the close of the period from the england which william won it differed still more from the england of the renaissance and the reformation the four centuries following the conquest saw much growth and change otherwise they would have little interest but the end as the beginning was medieval in its simplicity its romance its crudeness and its color and all that goes essentially to make up the idea of the middle ages in this period feudalism proper grew and decayed constitutional government had a wonderful genesis and a temporary failure religion in its orthodox form flourished exceedingly and triumphed over eager and spasmodic heresy the period saw infinite possibilities of empire building by english kings which dwindled as the years wore on and determined the political individuality of england a traditional feud with france was the method of this determination and affected some of the greatest issues of the period economic forces of immense significance transformed the land but the form of society at the end of the period as in the beginning was medieval it is the object of this little book to trace the essential features of medieval england end of preface Chapter One of England in the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. England in the Middle Ages by Elizabeth O'Neill. The Norman Settlement, 1066 through 1100. The crowning of William the Norman on Midwinter Day, 1066, marks a definite crisis in English history. The Saxon system, in its strength and weakness, its sturdiness and its insularism, gave way to a new order which, by way of experiment and with some sacrifice, was to be the way of progress. The weight of the conqueror's hand was to be felt in a conscious readjustment of the national institutions a process carried out with a passion for legal definition which ignored fine shades of custom and tradition and which in so far was brutal as a set-off to this prime fact it must be remembered that now for the first time england was brought into touch and ultimately into line with european civilization and this at the outset of a period whose refinements were outstandingly cosmopolitan the ultimate results to the national life were undoubtedly beneficial but meanwhile the conquest was a real conquest and involved the inevitable suffering which accompanies the degradation of a proud nation the new civilization involved class distinctions which had never before been felt so keenly in england for almost three centuries the upper classes spoke french and only french so that even kings who sympathized and were loved of their people could not speak their language as the years wore on and the inevitable fusion did its work the foreign element was merged into the english the foreign idiom became the despised french of stratford atibot and this is but significant of the triumph of the strong subsoil of english life over the norman elements which had meanwhile done so much for its improvement the conscious policy of the first norman king made for such fusion from the first for the conqueror was a statesman even more than a soldier there was no immediate confiscation of lands from the english after hastings there was ample from which to reward william's norman followers in the lands of those who had 
died for Harold. The English landowners paid homage for their lands and received them again, with a difference. But Hastings was not the conquest, and in the passionate revolts of the next few years, the English race of nobles and gentlemen was swept away and the English aristocracy became Norman, though an English leaven was provided by the choice of wives from among the English. William made no immediate difference in the formal government of England. He discerned in the democratic basis of the English courts or moots an element which might be taken into alliance with the crown in the struggle which he inevitably foresaw between his own conception of kingship and the anarchic forces of feudalism. In 1067, William left England for his lands over sea, for henceforth, for centuries, the interests of an English king were thus duplicated. He tactfully took with him most of the English nobles, but the reaction which he thus strove to avert was precipitated by the reckless tyranny of the Norman nobles who were left behind, and whose aim was merely to exploit the conquered country. The English rose as one man in all parts of the country except the southeast, which had had first-hand experience of William's power. The king returned to stamp out a revolution which was the more formidable for the support of the Danes and Scotch, which it won. It took William four years to kill resistance, but he did it so thoroughly that he left no hope for another such movement among the English. The struggle has a romantic and heroic interest as we dimly discern the figures of the Saxon leaders fighting hopefully or desperately for their racist cause. There were the earls Edwin and Morcar, the former three times forsworn, yet so fascinating in his fair beauty that William wept for his fate when Edwin was murdered by his own followers. There were two bishops like Ethelwyn, taking the revenge for their dethronement in favor of the Norman prelates whom William favored. There were figures like Waltheof, son of Syward the Stout, doing wonder deeds in the north against the Norman, and Hereward the Wake, who joined Edwin and Morcar in the camp of refuge at Eli, and held it with some hundreds of desperate Englishmen until William bridged the fens with a causeway and compelled them to come in to his allegiance. Earl Waltheof, too, had given in at last and held faithful to his word, but he was made the victim of a belated plot. Betrayed, some say, by his wife Judith, the conqueror's niece, he died a martyr's death, being beheaded at Winchester and laid to rest in the abbey he loved at Crowland. Hereward was slain sleeping by a band of Bretons under Ralph of Tewkesbury, jealous of his favor with the king. These heroic figures are the sublimated types of the Englishmen of their day, brave unquestionably, spiritual with little of the element of fear which played so large a part in the religion of the Normans, whose religion acted in reaction from ruthlessness. But they seemed to have lacked something which the Norman had, of forethought and organizing power, the great gift of that race to the English nation. The hold of William on the English was finally secured when in 1072 Malcolm Canmore of Scotland, who had married the sainted Margaret, niece of Edward the Confessor and sister of Edgar the Etheling, definitely did homage to the conqueror at Abernethy on the Tay and reconcile with him to the Etheling whom he had been helping. The outstanding result of the struggle, besides the prime fact of the renewed submission of the English, was the devastation of the North, for William deemed it a salutary lesson to lay waste the land between the Umber and the Tees, burning the cottages and killing man and beast, so that the land lay literally desert for nearly a decade. The English resistance was dead but William had to reckon with the turbulence of his Norman followers. All the broad lands of England were his now to give, and he satisfied their greed. The feudal theory by which all the land of the kingdom was the king's to give out, as he would, was taken for granted, but William had seen the workings of the feudal system in France. He knew the power of a great vassal like himself 
when he chose to oppose his liege lord the king of france whether by accident or design these conditions were not reproduced in england the normans who received the largest grants of land found that their possessions were scattered over the country so that it would not be easy for any one man to concentrate an army against the king in case of rebellion only in the great palatine earldoms on uncertain border country did he swerve from this policy and give to the tenant almost regal power as at durham and chester such was necessary in the cause of order nevertheless william had to face many vexatious feudal revolts for years at his wedding feast at norwich in ten seventy five earl ralph of norfolk joined roger of hereford in a plot against william they and wealthy of if he would join them but he refused should share the power between them the english support on which they counted was reserved for william and defeated the hired breton soldiers of the rebels robert william's eldest son one of the most interesting figures in this period for a modern touch of indifference which acted in a curious contrast with feverish births of striving rose in revolt against his father in ten seventy nine demanding his heritage of normandy and maine promised to him on his father's death father and son met in arms at gerberoy and normandy the son wounded the father in the hand unknowingly and there followed immediately a characteristically medieval scene of passionate remorse and reconciliation robert had the support of william's norman vassals who hoped for greater license under a rule less stern the fact was further illustration to william of the evils of continental feudalism and he took a further step for the prevention of its growth in england in ten eighty five he was advised by the wise men at gloucester to make an inquest into the state of the country to find out how much land there was in every shire how many landholders and lesser men and the worth of them all the results were written down in domesday book from which we glean nearly all we know of the conditions which prevailed in the england of that day in ten eighty six william summoned all military tenants whether holding from himself or from his tenants to swear an oath of allegiance to him on salisbury plain it has generally been considered as an act of great significance though some recent historians have suggested that it was not without precedent according to a pure feudal system subtenants men holding land from the king's tenants or the tenants in chief owed allegiance only to their immediate lord who could and did lead them against their king the salisbury oath prevented this the king in such matters was to have precedence over the lord and william secured thus for the english crown a direct hold on the military forces of feudal england it may be well to realize here that england had now become feudal in a very real sense that forces were tending towards the state before the conquest is certain but equally certain is it that the conquest and the assumptions of the norman lawyers made universal what was before but local many englishmen had in the disturbed days of the danish invasions commended their lands to richer neighbors and received them back again with the promise of protection in return for homage and perhaps some service here is the germ of feudalism but there were parts of england and especially in the northeast where free men dwelt on what would now be called small holdings and owned allegiance to no man but loyalty to their king there was no place for these in the feudal system as known by the norman lawyers whose tendency was merely to assume their dependence the net result was a degradation in the status though not always in the mode of life of many such men english feudalism as a political system had from the first the hiatus caused by the centralizing policy of the norman kings but it triumphed in england as a system of land tenure though disintegrating forces such as the growth of boroughs were early at work undermining it the feudal system had as its unit the manor with agricultural land 
some worked in the interest of the lord the mezzanland the rest in the interest of the tenants there were an infinite variety of tenures according to the service owed by the vassals some were servile tenures and some were free a free tenant might and would generally pay rent in kind or he might owe labor but in a definite and moderate degree the essence of a servile tenure was that the tenant was at the bailiff's disposal in the matters of the times and places at which he would serve the domesday report was made in terms of manners though the inquest was made through the english divisions of ville hundred and shire the norman tendency was to find a manorial unit and the term was applied even to the numerous free villages in the danish part of the land north of watling street where no other lord existed the king was assumed to hold the manor by the thirteenth century the manorial system was practically universal in england and the manor is approximated to one type an open field village with two roads intersecting each other along which the tenants had their dwellings with the church and the hall at the centre the fields were laid out in strips which belonged some to the tenants some to the lord of the manor the manor even in thirteenth century england was self-contained and self-sufficing still more was it so in the early norman period money was hardly used and the few specialized artisans were paid in kind domesday book accounted for two hundred and eighty thousand people these were chiefly the heads of families and when allowance is made for emissions of certain classes the population of the country may be computed at about one and a half millions about two hundred thousand are enumerated whose tenure was such that it was natural for the norman lawyers in a generation or two to write it down servile besides twenty thousand actual slaves a class which was merged into the rank of villain early in the norman period of higher classes of tenants thirty five thousand are enumerated so that even before the conquest these were already in the minority the effects of the feudal system on the social life of medieval england can hardly be exaggerated but the most characteristic aspect of continental feudalism had a little place here the lords of the manors did justice in minor manners but they could not deal with cases in which life or limb were involved these were reserved for the king's court one side of the conqueror's policy toward the land of england has earned for him a sinister renown he loved the great deer as though he were their father and he passed severe laws imposing cruel mutilations on all who should interfere with the royal hunting the story has been told endlessly of how william reserved the new forest for his pleasures and sacrificed whole villages to its cemetery but the light of modern research tends to discount the amount of destruction involved certain it is however that the forest laws were horribly severe and show a brutality which is not characteristic of the policy of these first norman kings the conqueror maintained the old english policy of avoiding the death penalty for mere felonies william's treatment of the english church affords better than any other sphere illustration of the manner in which continental standards were imposed upon the english a century before the conquest a monastic reform had spread over saxon england but its inspiration was exhausted and the standard of life among lower and higher clergy alike was extremely easy his sympathies and his policy alike inclined william to take measures to bring the forces of the hildebrandine revival to bear upon the english church the movement by which the great pope hildebrand had breathed new life into the western church was then in full force on the continent the norman prelates whom william brought to england were impregnated with it in ten ninety a complete reorganization of the english church was begun three papal legates took part in the council which determined the drastic measures of reform the pluralist stigand who had hitherto found some measure of favour with the king was deposed from canterbury and from winchester he was an outstanding example of the grasping spirit 
which pervaded the upper clergy in the lower ranks there was but little observance of the canons imposed by the church married priests abounded within two years two or at most three english bishops remained in english sees stegen was replaced by lanfranc abbot of st stephen's at caen whither he had gone from the famous benedictine abbey of beck he was a man outstanding for his scholarship and piety he had been a lawyer before the cloister claimed him and in his zeal for reform and efficiency he illustrates the better type of the great ecclesiastics of that period it has been stated to his discredit that he forged documents proving canterbury's privileges with regard to york but the standard of honour in these matters differed from that of to-day if the cause were acknowledgedly good an irritating absence of evidence to support it might surely be supplied it was probably he rather than william who decided that the separation of the ecclesiastical from the lay courts was necessary hitherto the bishops had sat in the lay courts and though they probably had the preponderance they had no monopoly of the meeting out of justice in cases which the church would have claimed as being liable to spiritual jurisdiction even these very councils which reformed ecclesiastical matters in england were held in the presence of the king and the lay lords william seems to have consented readily to decree the future separation of church and lay courts this was really a corollary of the acceptance of the hildebrandine standard of spirituality in the church the measure had in its inevitable seeds of friction but william felt his own strength too great to lay stress on this the seats of english bishoprics were in several cases removed from small and decaying places to towns whose progressive spirit made them a better setting a general bracing affected all sides of ecclesiastical life a spirit of labor and study led to a revival of english scholarship though it took the form of dogma and dialectics norman abbots reformed the monasteries and many new monastic foundations were made the change was for the better though here again hints of suffering come to us dimly at glastonbury thurston the new norman abbot called in french soldiers to enforce a new method of chanting on a community which seems to have been dull to learn but in no way recalcitrant after the fray many monks lay dead or wounded cut down in the very sanctuary thurston was deprived by the king and the case was probably without parallel but it may well have been an exaggerated example of the obscure suffering which so relentless a reform imposed from without must have caused during his visit to normandy in ten sixty seven the conqueror had lavished on norman churches rich treasures taken by way of fines from the english monasteries william ranked as a loyal son of the church but he was careful to uphold his position as an independent sovereign though he had come to win the realm under a papal banner he made it clear that he would owe no fealty to the pope for his kingdom a chronicler tells us that william also laid down certain rules which prevented undue intrusion of the ecclesiastical powers into lay spheres no pope should be acknowledged or papal bull received without the king's consent the separate church councils must have his sanction too to make their acts binding and none of his barons or servants were to be excommunicated without his permission whether formulated or not such was in fact the stand which william almost inevitably took on his deathbed he could boast that he had never hurt god's church though he was stained with rivers of blood it was while pursuing that continental policy which was to haunt so many english kings that william met his death in ten eighty nine he claimed the overlordship of maine and had temporarily secured it with english help in ten seventy three roused by an incursion into normandy of the people of montes early in ten eighty seven he revived an old claim on the vexin of which montes was the capital and went to war for it 
his anger was aggravated by the report of a jest of philip of france on the increasing corpulence of the english king the land round montes was savagely laid waste and the city itself burned the exertion and excitement aggravated the results of a violent knock against the pommel of his saddle caused by the stumbling of the king's horse in the streets of montes on his deathbed william bequeathed normandy and maine to robert a reluctant recognition of his claims as eldest son to william he gave england and to henry a sum of money with so the chroniclers said after the event the assurance that he would one day hold all that his father had ever had william the first in his gigantic strength his sane spirituality his stern and conscious zeal for justice untempered by mercy at once sublimates and typifies his race his son william resembled him in spite of the sinister impression some strange quality in him made on his contemporaries so that tradition has made of him almost a monster physically he was not unlike his father though with a less handsome bearing and a more marked corpulence he had a loud voice but not remarkably deep like the conqueror's his full-blooded complexion indicative of his choleric temperament brought him the nickname of rufus the red king was indeed terrible in anger as his father was yet he could boast that he never did in anger what he would not have done in cold blood he showed however none of the conqueror's scrupulous observance politic rather than sympathetic of the rights of his subjects and his rule soon shaped itself into a tyranny in the beginning the norman barons rose against william's rule on robert's behalf whose proverbial weakness would have made him an acceptable overlord to them lanfranc rallied the english in william's favour promising them good laws and the result was soon stamped out but in ten eighty nine lanfranc died and with him the traditions of the conqueror's rule ranulf flambard as justiciar became the foremost man in the realm and with his clever connivance william embarked on a course of tyranny it is often difficult to state with precision the exact nature of misrule in the middle ages and this applies the more to this period as the exact details of the working of the constitution what was preeminently a time of transition are not very clear much dissatisfaction may have arisen from the mere crystallizing of feudal practice and it is recorded that the justicia was careful to give a show of legal right to his tyranny in his capacity as judge too ranulf sold justice and any crime might be committed with impunity if the wrongdoer were able to give sufficient financial compensation we hear too of forced and excessive labor for the king was a great builder london bridge and the great hall at westminster were built by him all through history great building works have typified the power of tyrants and in periods when feudalism broke bounds forced labor at castle building was always a crying grievance with the oppressed moreover william showed little respect for the rights and dignities of the church grossly immoral in his private life in health he was a loud and shameless blasphemer but in illness he cringed to religion he kept abbacies and bishoprics in his own hands when they fell vacant and administered them with a heavy hand not for four years after lanfranc's death did he appoint his successor and then in ten ninety three ill and repentant he forced the primacy on anselm the saintly abbot of beck anselm was one of those meek men who are obdurate where a principle is involved like many another medieval prelate he was more ultramontane than the pope himself he had no inclination to be yoked to a wild bull but once in harness he would not allow himself to be run away with already in ten ninety three there was friction the king preparing for an expedition to normandy refused the liberal contribution of anselm towards his expenses as too small he refused to fill several abbacies which he held vacant finally he declared that he had no need of the archbishop's blessing to his crossing over and departed unblessed after william's return in ten ninety five 
an open quarrel took place over anselm's recognition of urban as the rightful one of two rival popes william regarded this as an infringement of his own rights over the english church ultimately he recognized urban independently two years later the king complained bitterly of the equipment of the knights furnished by anselm for his service in wales for every bishop was a baron too and even anselm had so far borne himself as such towards the king he refused however to answer for his neglect in person and left england for rome where he received little encouragement and so withdrew to france where he remained until after the red king's death william's prowess justified his father's choice of him as king of england in one particular at least he was glorious in arms normandy cut up and bartered among the three brothers for some years fell at last to the english king in ten ninety five when robert elected to go on crusade and mortgaged his heritage for the needful gold the conquest of wales was in process and was only prevented from completion by william's death as it was the south and east were won by normans who became the marcher lords north wales alone remained under native control cumberland was reft from scotland and malcolm had once more to acknowledge himself the man of the english king he died before william and his saintly wife margaret soon followed him disappointed in her hope for the life of the cloister she had devoted all the force of her idealism to civilizing and in some sort anglicizing her husband's realm william's triumphant course was cut short by his tragic death from the arrow of his friend walter tyrrell while hunting in the new forest it was probably quite accidental men saw in it the appropriate judgment of god his body lay all day in the forest for walter stricken with panic had fled at sunset it was taken up and drawn in a charcoal burner's cart to winchester in the cathedral there the second norman king was laid to rest unhouseled unanointed unannealed End of chapter 1chapter two of england in the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org england in the middle ages by elizabeth o'neill the menace of feudalism eleven hundred to eleven fifty four henry the red king's brother was hunting with him when he fell and immediately rode off to winchester to secure the royal treasure there were some who would have withstood him in robert's name but he had the advantage of being on the spot quick to act and diplomatic he won his ends the wise men acclaimed him king there was in no sense an election for though in those days the rule of secession was vague the elective element only entered in as putting the seal on established fact robert was on crusade and in any case could only have been acceptable to the worser feudal element in hope to make profit of his foibles henry i ranks as one of england's best kings yet it is in the same sense as the conqueror he acted in the interests of the people because it was the straightest way to power in person he resembled his father perhaps more than did his brother being dark in complexion stout too but not so tall he had inherited his father's pleasant deep voice he was a scholar and was sometimes called beauclerk and he had all a norman lawyer's passion for order and definition he has for us little of the personal interest of his father still less the morose fascination of his brother his work rather than his temperament arrests attention certainly it is that henry made up his mind to pursue his father's policy of encouraging english institutions at the expense of the more objectionable traits of feudalism time had been wanting to the first william to form any definite and lasting amalgamation it seems that rufus used the english institutions only to abuse them 
henry was loud and constant in his assurance that he would put down all unrighteousness that had been in his brother's time within a few days of his coronation he issued a charter of liberties to be sent into every shire embodying his intentions to reform it was the first english charter of so many its essence was the promise to the church and to the lay lords that they should be free from unjust exactions the barons must extend similar treatment to their men the law of king edward was to be restored with the changes made by the conqueror this was always the ideal in point of fact henry taxed the nation heavily throughout his reign and in his feudal relations leaned to severity but he kept order and he established a centralized administrative system which made for routine and equal justice above all he maintained peace and the familiar formula of praise was applied once again to him in his days a man or woman might fare through the land with their bosoms full of gold and no man dare say aught to them but good the work of organization which henry wrought can best be examined in the light of its development under his grandson henry the second suffice it to say that he established a central system of justice which sent out itinerant judges who sat in the local english courts and under old forms gave new and royal justice the new system of trial by duel which became the rule in criminal cases is first heard of under henry it was the beginning of the process by which the king's justice practically took possession of the shire courts for the future too courts were to meet at set times in the old accustomed places stipulation which arbitrary actions on the part of the sheriffs during a period of disorganization had probably made necessary rano flambard had been in prison at the beginning of the reign but had had the ingenuity to obtain a rope in a barrel of wine and escape from the tower the justiciar in this reign though he probably had not the title was roger bishop of salisbury who controlled the whole administration and created the exchequer system an illuminating anecdote tells that it was his quickness in getting through the saying of his mass as a simple priest which first attracted henry's attention to him roger was a norman but henry had sufficiently shown his english sympathies by his choice of a wife he married in the first year of his reign edith daughter of malcolm and saint margaret and thus a representative of the old west saxon house she now took the norman name matilda the interpretation put on the marriage by contemporaries is illustrated by the nicknames which the normans jeeringly applied to the king and queen of godric and gakifu the feudal elements rose in revolt almost immediately robert was back in normandy from the holy land where he had won by his brilliant prowess offer of a crown only to refuse it the duchy naturally lapsed to him again on the death of william the leading barons in england offered him their help to win the crown of england he gave a willing ear and came to try his luck in eleven o one henry had mobilized the english feared and taught it how to fight but as always he preferred the methods of diplomacy a yearly payment and some minor concessions of land in normandy satisfied robert and henry was free to punish the barons who had turned traitor some less prominent rebels were immediately disinherited and went back to normandy the more prominent were dealt with with deliberate revengefulness each in turn men like robert or lacy or the cowardly ivo of grant messieur who had run away from the crusade most prominent and divine of all was robert of belaim who had lands and castles scattered all over england these were taken piecemeal and robert allowed to withdraw a landless man to console himself with his norman possessions two years later he went to war with the duke and anarchy reigned in the duchy the conditions invited henry's interference he restored order but did not yet show his hand the banishment of william of mortain another of the dangerous barons with possessions on both sides of the channel reinforced robert of belaim who again took arms 
in eleven o five henry once more crossed to normandy and took caen and bayou for his own a third expedition in the next year found all the forces of the two roberts and william united against him at tuchibri henry won the battle and robert of belaim fleeing in panic before the issue alone among the leaders saved himself duke robert the brilliant crusader who had lightly foregone so much and caught always at chatos was brought back to england to live out his days a captive the english and henry's army boasted that they had avenged hastings when they conquered normandy at tuchibri in effect the duchy did now take the character of a mere appendage to england resistance there was not dead and intermittently discontented barons rose against henry's rule in favour of william cleto robert's son the french king too when it suited him aided his cause the year eleven ten again saw barons driven from england to normandy as a result of these vast confiscations the king had much land to give he found it as it were a new nobility drawn largely from the increasing class of skilled administrators produced by the development of a more elaborate system henry i was a loyal churchman in much the same sense as his father ready to give the church its due but determined to maintain royal and national rights against any attempt at encroachment and in his day there came a trial of strength for which the time had not been ripe under the conqueror the hildebrandine revolution had won to itself all the churches in europe and with growing power the papal claims grew too the conflict with anselm which played so large a part in the reign of henry was on a different plane from that between the archbishop and the red king there is no question of arbitrary abuse on henry's part it was a conflict of principles which were being brought into fresh prominences in europe at large the investiture struggle in england was as it were a miniature copy of the duel between pope and emperor which loomed so prominently in the history of the period henry immediately on his accession invited anselm to return from his wanderings the temporalities of his see confiscated by rufus were in the king's hands he prepared to restore them expecting from the archbishop the homage customary on such occasions to his surprise anselm made demure the pope so he informed henry did not approve of lay investiture henry was dumbfounded he was anxious to be on friendly terms with the church if only to keep his support in his claim to the english throne but every bishop was a baron too and he could not forego his authority over them that the attitude of the archbishop was new and startling is proved by the fact that anselm had received unquestioningly investiture from the king's predecessor the attitude of the papacy on the subject of lay investiture was part of a conscious policy which hoped to build up an imperial church homogeneous and independent able to show a united front to the nations which in their secular aspect should be subservient to it and accept its standards it represented the most characteristic ideal of the medieval papacy in the period of its greatest predominance henry wisely suggested that a settlement should be postponed meanwhile the archbishop was allowed to enjoy the revenues of his see in eleven o two an embassy to the pope to present both sides received no satisfaction but henry by this time felt himself fairly secure on the english throne and took courage to demand that anselm should do him the customary homage his own envoys to rome assured him that the pope had given them private assurance that he would not interfere with henry should the king take things into his own hands so long as suitable men were appointed to the bishoprics for necessarily the right to investment ultimately the power to choose anselm however proposed a new embassy to rome and so things dragged on in a state of suspense and in eleven o three anselm himself went out of england to plumb the papal politics in person at length the question was settled by way of compromise 
discussed lengthily in the intervening years and legalized in 1109. For the future, the king could not invest with the ring and staff, symbols of the spiritual office of the bishop, but he was to retain the investiture with the fief. Elections were to be made in the king's chapel with the consent of the king, and homage done for the fief before consecration. On the whole question, the victory was to the king, though it must be remembered that in individual cases where dual authority enters into the battle, will be to the strong. The settlement of the question anticipated the letter of that between Pope and Emperor in the Concordat of Worms in 1122, but the spirit was different. In that case, the substantial victory was won temporarily by the spiritual arm. Anselm died in 1109, and for five years the archbishopric was vacant, the king applying his revenues, apparently without protest, to his own various purposes. An illustration of the limitation the observance of his charter promises. Meanwhile, forces in the English church were making for a new balance between church and state, bringing about naturally the state of things which Anselm, in deference to the papal ideal, would have imposed artificially. The ideals of the Hildebrandine papacy came to be the stock mode of thinking in the English church, and the king's victory in the matter of episcopal appointments came to mean nothing when every possible nominee was an ardent papalist. Before the end of Henry's reign, the forces of monasticism were strengthened by several houses of Cistercians, the new French order of white monks, which under the inspiration of Stephen Harding, the Englishman, had formulated a new and severe interpretation of the Benedictine rule. The order found its safeguard against the looseness of practice which had beset the black months in an emphasis of that element of manual work which St. Benedict had prescribed. The form this took was agricultural labor, and the Cistercians became famous farmers. In England, especially in the north, they settled in remote spots as in the wilds of Yorkshire and devoted themselves to pasturage and the production of wool. The labor of the choir monks could not suffice alone for the maintenance of their farms, and the employment of lay brethren, bound to the religious life but not to the recitation of the office, became a feature of the order. In the economic sphere, the settlement of the Cistercians is important, because the export trade in wool was one of the most important sources of English wealth, in the Middle Ages. Already in the second generation of the Norman settlement, there were found lay landlords like Richard of Rulos, who were remembered for their generosity and their wise and kindly administration of their lands. The monasteries, for the most part, were much larger than the manors, probably acted on similar lines. The Cistercians represented only one wave of the monastic reform, before the end of Henry's reign, fifty houses of black canons of St. Augustine, in order theoretically uniting the active with the contemplative life, had been founded in England. These regular canons were often attached to hospital and lazar houses, as were the nuns of the order. But there were, too, many large houses of canons, whose practice differed little, if at all, from that of the ordinary black monks of St. Benedict. The great monastic movement in Henry's reign at once signified and furthered the growing power of the church. The church courts developed freely. Appeals to Rome became frequent. In 1125, a papal legate, the first to come to England since Henry's accession, made a full visitation of England, and henceforth the Archbishop of Canterbury became standing papal legate in England. Thus the cause which Anselm had fought and seemingly lost was slowly asserting itself, and when under Henry the Second the wills of church and state clashed, the balance of power had shifted considerably. Henry was probably hardly conscious of these things or he may have deemed it impossible to stem the tide. He was busy with many things. For twenty years after the compromise with Anselm, he was engaged 
intermittently in a struggle with france louis the sixth the french king was the first to conceive the idea of a national france whose realization was to be deferred so long through the centrifugal forces of french feudalism not the least impediment to the french king's policy was the anomaly by which the english kings held so much of french territory it was hardly a fair fight but it was hard fought his irritation made him a ready supporter of the unruly norman barons with their spurious support of william fitz robert henry strengthened himself by marrying his daughter matilda to the holy roman emperor as the ruler of the loose federation of german states was styled another daughter to the earl of Brittany, and his son william to the daughter of the earl of anjou it was after a satisfactory peace in eleven twenty resultant on a brilliant english victory at the battle of bramuel in the previous year a battle which had seen the french king a fugitive that the tragedy of henry's life occurred his son william the heir to the throne was drowned with his illegitimate brother and sister in the wreck of the white ship crossing the channel on a fair sea the sailors being demoralized by drink the result of the bounty of the young prince henry was a self-centred and self-contained character but he seems to have loved his son passionately and tradition had it that he was never again seen to smile queen matilda had died two years before and henry married in eleven twenty one adelisa of louvain but the marriage had no issue william had been his only legitimate son and he bent all his energies to secure the secession to the english throne of his daughter matilda the wife of the emperor in eleven twenty five her husband died and the empress returned at her father's bidding from the land whither she had gone fifteen years before as a child of eight and which she loved as she could never love england the secession of a queen and her right to the english throne had as henry knew no precedent though feudal law permitted the secession of women to baronies nevertheless henry demanded in eleven twenty six an oath from all the baronage of england lay and spiritual to support her secession david of scotland swore and after him the king's son robert of gloucester and his nephew stephen of boulogne the french king on realizing that matilda was also to secede to the duchy of normandy and the great impediment to french unity thus prolonged again took up arms on behalf of william of normandy henry met the crisis by the marriage of matilda to geoffrey son of fulk duke of anjou the natural enemy of normandy the step was most abhorrent to the norman barons and, and henry would probably not have taken it if he could have foreseen the death of william fitz robert which occurred in the following year henry remained in comparatively peaceful possession of normandy until his death in normandy on the first of december eleven thirty five the traditional surfeit of lampreys if it did not cause accelerated his end he was a man of rare physical strength and his reign of thirty-five years was remarkably long for a medieval sovereign his body was carried back to england and buried in the abbey he had founded at Reading the forces of conservatism was stronger than henry's prevision and stephen his nephew was chosen to rule england in spite of the pledges in favour of matilda stephen was the son of adela the conqueror's daughter and henry count of blois and himself married to matilda the heiress of boulogne and granddaughter through his mother of malcolm and margaret of scotland he was a favourite of henry who does not seem to have doubted his faith and of the londoners who knew him well personally he had all the graces of manner which matilda out of tune with her fate and environment lacked he was ambitious and rightly calculating on the unpopularity of a woman's rule increased in this case by the norman baron's hatred of matilda's angevin husband he made a bid for the english crown and won it like henry himself he realized the importance of being on the spot 
he first enlisted the support of the londoners who had all the townsmen hatred of disorder in the middle ages the death of a king was always a crisis at which the bonds which held society loosely were apt to give way and the londoners saw in stephen's accession the nearest way to the good order they most desired how far they were mistaken is shown in the chaos of the next two decades for stephen's abilities were not equal to his ambition and the weakness of his position added to the weakness of his character gave a unique opportunity for the display of a rampant feudalism acting as it were in reaction from the bonds in which the norman kings had bound it at first few lay lords came into stephen's allegiance but he won the great churchmen to his cause including his brother henry of winchester their scruples about their oath in matilda's favour being overcome by the assurance of the perjured hugh bigot who declared that henry had regretted it on his deathbed the lay lords had no scruples and when archbishop william had crowned stephen at westminster on midwinter day eleven thirty five they submitted to his authority and took the gifts he gave with lavish hands it is to be noted once more how small a part election in any real sense played in the appointment of the sovereign stephen ruled england for nineteen years during most of this period the country was in a state of civil war more or less active between his partisans and those of matilda matilda had many chances of success through stephen's alienating his supporters but when stephen being a prisoner she was actually crowned king in eleven forty one she lost her supporters by her absurdly arbitrary behaviour two or three incidents stand out in the struggle the battle of the standard in eleven thirty eight when david of scotland came to his niece's aid with the eucharist borne before his army the scotch king's piety availed him little for neither his mailed knights nor his light-armed galloway men could resist the force of the arrows let fly by the english longbow a weapon whose use had lately been borrowed from the south welch and which was to play so large a part in medieval methods of warfare stephen conceived mistrust of roger bishop of salisbury and his son and nephews the clever administrators of henry i and arrested them to the indignation of his own brother henry bishop of winchester who transferred his support to matilda so the party shifted until eleven fifty three stephen wearily agreed to the treaty of wallingford which secured him the crown for life but provided as his successor matilda and geoffrey's son henry of anjou stephen died in the next year the importance of his reign whose tale reads so barrenly is the illustration it affords of the nature and value of the policy of the kings who preceded and followed him his reign is the one period of the middle ages during which england experienced the horrors of continental feudalism stephen with his handsome bearing and frank chivalry seems to have inherited the strain in the conqueror's family represented by robert of normandy he was in no sense indifferent to the welfare of his reign but he was too weak to cope with its disorders for he was a mild man and soft and good and did no justice the chroniclers are loud in their plaints on the sufferings of the kingdom while stephen and matilda fought for power and none wielded it the whole royal administrative system broke down and there was no justice but the feudal justice which it had been the aim of the norman kings to limit adulterine castles rose all over the land and the english people built them with forced labour the greed for gain led the worser kind of baron to imprison and torture even the poorest to wring their possessions from them every man in those days we are told did what was right in his own eyes they cared nothing for the ban of the church for they were all forecursed and forsworn and forlorn the oppressors said openly that christ and his saints slept and the people were fain to believe them one other significance this interlude has for us it shows the entire powerlessness of the english people leaderless before their conquerors and the value to them of the alliance with the crown against the forces of feudalism 
Henry the Second had to take up the work where his grandfather had left it. The church alone gained some fruition from this time. The process towards independence, which had been going on under Henry the First, was hastened, and a prescriptive right strengthened its increasing jurisdiction and its growing privilege. The desire for refuge from a troubled world probably accelerated the growth in the number of monasteries which went on apace. In the buildings of this period, is seen already the transition from the round arches and simple solidity of the architecture which the Normans brought to the pointed and lighter forms which are characteristic of the full Middle Ages. The death of Stephen and the accession of Henry the Second marks at once a revival of old customs and the beginnings of things which were to transform the new time. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of England in the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. England in the Middle Ages by Elizabeth O'Neill. The Angevin Despotism, 1154 through 1216. Henry the Second of England was the first of a new line of kings but he had much in common with his mother's race. Not so tall or handsome as the conqueror and his sons, he had the same sturdy build. He is described as round-headed, with reddish hair and keen gray eyes, a description reminiscent of Rufus. Men remarked on his tough, coarse hands and his bowed legs, for he was ever in the saddle. Nor would he sit except at meals or in council. He was tireless in energy and terrible in anger uncontrolled as were all the Angevins. He was twenty-two years old in 1154, and he had a vast inheritance in France. He was a Frenchman in his sympathies, but too much the lawyer and statesman not to enter with zest into the task of administration in England. The work he did was finally to crush the anarchical elements in English feudalism. His method was centralization and he took the people into his alliance. His ideal was not above those of his day, and was circumscribed by the outlook of feudalism, but his vigor wrought to a better end than he dreamed. There was a hidden danger in the despotism, which the first Angevin built up. The crown itself might become the oppressor of all classes. This is what happened under the third Angevin, John, and in a minor degree under Richard. A new rearrangement of forces in the state was brought about to resist this tyranny. Henry's policy had fostered the amalgamation of Norman and English institutions, in time aided in the amalgamation of the two races, so that the resistance to John was a national movement in which all classes had some part. Henry's first care was to restore as far as possible the system of Henry I with the aid of the ministers who had survived from that reign. Stephen's mercenaries were sent out of England and the adultering castles destroyed. Henry met with very little resistance, for he acted at the same time with firmness and judgment. In 1159 he instituted the Great Scottish, by which barons were allowed to commute their military service for a payment of money with which the king could hire mercenaries. This was at once a blow at feudal custom and a step towards military efficiency, for the mercenaries were not hampered by any time limit as the feudal knights were. Their forty days' service was of little use to the king when he gave battle overseas. Later in the reign, the Assize of Arms decreed that every man in England, even the lanes who were rich enough, should be armed according to his means. This was really a revival of the old English militia, and an excellent measure for national defense. The development of the administrative and judicial system on the lines laid down by Henry I went on apace. Originally, the term curia regis was used to denote two different things. It described the commune concilium, the whole assembly of tenants-in-chief, which in a limited sense replaced the old English Witten, 
or meeting of wise men as general advisers to the king it described two of the ministers who administered the royal finance and justice in the former aspect it became the first exchequer and as a special trained class was told off to do its work the exchequer even under the first henry divided itself from the curia proper the methods by which the king's accounts were kept not just in slips of wood bring home to us the primitive nature of twelfth century civilization the name curia regis was gradually limited to the body which administered royal justice the greater part of its activity was spent in the shire courts for henry the second made the system of itinerant justices or justices in ire which his grandfather had conceived a regular institution the hundred courts sank into insignificance for the private feudal courts usurped their functions but royal justice practically took possession of the shire courts henry secured this in two ways the inquest of sheriffs in eleven seventy resulted in a wholesale removal of the sheriffs who were largely local magnates and in so far had feudalized the courts royal officers were put in their places and the justice which they dealt was in so far royal justice but the most important cases were reserved for the justices in ire practically all criminal justice and the greater number of civil cases fell to them and as they gave law they made it the common law of england was fashioned from their findings the centralization of the source of law triumphed over local peculiarities and alone made a common law possible in time the shire courts became mere historic survivals and as such remain today the policy of henry or the more enlightened legality of the age revolutionized too the methods of judgment the method of compurgation which seems intolerable to us now can hardly have been satisfactory even in the simple conditions of medieval society there had been a growing tendency to reject oath helpers for fiery or watery ordeal to modern minds even more impossible as is too the norman system of trial by duel especially when this came to be performed by proxy trial by jury in our modern sense was a thing of very slow growth its germ has been discerned in a hundred of our ancestral institutions alfred used to be acclaimed its father in point of fact it was the norman kings who began tentatively to apply the principle on which it rests and it was henry the second who made this application in any sense common the system of trial by inquest in which jurators were sworn to inquire impartially into the truth of a case and declare it now became common in civil cases henry too restored the use of the grand jury of presentment but the growth of a real jury system was slower even in criminal than in civil cases and the methods of justice remained throughout the middle ages marvelously crude to our modern notions one aspect of henry's policy was not so successful he was anxious to round off his system by defining and limiting the power of the church it was partly to this end that he gave the archbishopric of canterbury to his friend thomas becket a courtly deacon whom he had appointed chancellor becket was a brave soldier and an excellent boon companion a lively talker frank and excitable handsome too with his tall figure and clear pallor set off by his dark hair henry had found him active in the chancellorship and had every reason to hope much from his cooperation in his ecclesiastical measures as chancellor he had taxed the church heavily for henry's wars plunging his sword into the bowels of his mother but there was an incalculable element in medieval religion becket seems to have taken his appointment as a call from god and never a bad man he disgusted henry by his sudden conversion into a saint with some of the asperities of sanctity which were bound to clash with the policy of the king he resigned the chancellorship and stood as it were on the defensive in eleven sixty four henry issued his program for the church in the famous constitutions of clarendon 
the clerk in those days did not correspond exactly to our modern priest or clergyman there were hundreds of scholars in minor orders who never aspired to the priesthood and in the later middle ages any educated man could claim benefit of clergy it was said that during henry's reign already more than a hundred murders had been committed by clerks in one prominent case when a canon of bedford was accused of murder he was acquitted on oath in the bishop's court and flouted the king's justice who summoned him to answer to the charge henry swore by the eyes of god to bring him to submission but the archbishop declared the competence of the church courts to try clerical offenders this case probably merely accelerated the issues the constitutions of clarendon formulate much that had been common practice and to which becket could not have objected but there were clauses which represented an innovation on the practice which had grown up and it is round these that the controversy grew henry desired that a clerk accused of a crime should first be brought before the lay court where he could plead benefit of clergy he should then be taken before the church court and if found guilty receive the appropriate unfrocking and spiritual deprivations and then be handed over to the lay court to be tried again as a layman and punished as such becket regarded this as grossly unfair and as insulting to the ecclesiastical arm he seems to have agreed to the king's policy before its definite formulation but he rejected the constitutions and reproached himself bitterly for his lapse suspending himself from his functions and craving pardon from the pope an attack of a particularly invidious nature was made on the archbishop by his enemies referring to a point of his administration as chancellor becket fled to france where the pope then was but found less zealous support than he could have wished on several occasions in history the papacy has resented the action of two zealous englishmen in pitting their power against english practice for six years the archbishop remained in exile and then a kind of truce being called he returned to his see in 1170 to find himself forgotten and looked upon askance by all save the poor who remembered his charities he was armed with power from the pope to suspend roger archbishop of york who had crowned the king's son henry the king being anxious to secure a certain secession and two other bishops the news that he had issued the sentence on christmas day reached henry overseas four days afterwards armed knights animated by the bitter words which henry had let fall in his anger at the news burst into canterbury cathedral at the hour of vespers and brutally killed the archbishop taunting him as a traitor he met his death with the courage of a soldier and the resignation of a saint and when the monks took him up and marked the hair shirt beneath his vestments a revulsion of feeling spread among the people and he was acclaimed saint his shrine became the richest in the land and at it henry did public and sincere penance he renounced the constitutions but it is difficult to say which side had won the victory the church kept its jurisdiction over clerks accused of crimes though not in cases of high treason or offences against the forest laws on the other hand minor offences whether by clerk or layman were judged in the lay courts as also were all suits involving the right of property even presentation to livings the church however monopolized jurisdiction over marriages and wills on the question of appeals to the pope henry simply laid down his arms the new age was to see new disputes but the ground of the quarrel shifted henry's position as the head of a great empire impressed his contemporaries greatly but he does not seem to have formed any great scheme of extension or organization beyond an anxiety characteristic of the age to aggrandize himself through the marriage of his children he inherited normandy and maine from his mother anjou from his father aquitaine when he married eleanor of that duchy and the former wife of the french king eleanor was ten years older than her husband and had proved as incompatible with him as with louis 
by his son geoffrey's marriage he got control of brittany and thus the english king held more of french territory than the french king himself who was his natural enemy henry showed a feverish anxiety to have the secession to his territories settled and by crowning his son in his lifetime roused his ambition unduly the brothers were always quarrelling amongst themselves and eleanor who was finally imprisoned encouraged them in revolt against their father in eleven seventy three the young king rose in rebellion louis and william the lion of scotland helped him and the discontented barons in england chiefly those who had lands also in normandy made one final bid to overthrow henry's despotic and ordered rule henry beat down all opposition and the warm support which the english people gave him in the struggle showed the norman barons the hopelessness of their aims william the lion was taken prisoner henry had at the beginning of his reign recovered northumberland and cumberland lost to the scotch under stephen and now once more a scotch king did homage to his brother of england in eleven eighty three the young king henry died but his three brothers continued their quarrels the favor which henry showed to john the youngest was one great motive of dissension earl john showed something of his character in his outrageous behavior as governor in ireland in eleven eighty five for ireland had been added to henry's empire in the casual way in which these things were sometimes done in the middle ages it may give the modern reader a thrill to read of the beginnings of that relation which had been pregnant of so much but the imagination of contemporary seems to have been stirred hardly at all when henry quietly annexed ireland the two williams had probably both intended the conquest of ireland but time failed them as it might have failed henry too but for the appeal which dermot king of lanister made for help to recover his wife from the lord of latrum who had carried her off ireland was still in a tribal state she had received christianity in the fifth century at least and realized it vividly but her church remained missionary and monastic and though irish learning and irish sanctity had been proverbial for some centuries the people seemed to have no genius to guide them to political unity they were a natural prey but in eleven sixty six henry could not give them his attention dermot was however allowed to get what help he could from the barons and strongbow earl of pembroke went fought his battles married his daughter and set all ireland by the ears henry himself went over in eleven seventy two and many kings including the high king roderick o'connor did homage to him in a dim blind way probably realizing nothing of the significance henry put on his suzerainty the king left a viceroy the norman adventurers won lands at the point of the sword north east and south of the pale intermarried and became more irish than the irish themselves henry's plan to interest john in ireland designing it for his patrimony was not a success but the earl's witty tutor gerald of barry has left us a lively account of the people and their character which differs hardly at all from that of frossard or even edmund spencer in which allowing for the difference in the external details of civilization might stand as a sufficiently accurate description of the irish of to-day henry's last years were spent in a grief-stricken struggle against his sons aided by the new french king philippe augustus ill and weary he made peace on the fourth of july eleven eighty nine and sick at heart at finding that john too was among the rebels he died three days after in his fever forgetful of his successes in the past and crying shame to himself as a conquered king a glamour has been set over the reign of richard of the lion heart who succeeded his father the titular sovereignty of ireland alone falling to john his only surviving brother he was almost an ideal knight as the age understood knighthood but a very indifferent king he did england the service of neglecting her and allowing the system of henry the second to go on steadily working under men more capable than himself to direct it though the memory of richard has been cherished by the english people 
he was perhaps the least english of our early kings he was much more interested in the french empire which he inherited almost intact and he valued england mainly as a source of income the country was drained for his enterprises and but that the times were prosperous and justice strictly given much misery might have ensued richard's rule must be described as essentially a tyranny mitigate it by its character of routine the king's first thought was to raise money to join the third crusade an enterprise which was drawing the leaders of chivalry all over europe the great sultan saladin had wrested jerusalem from the christian kings who had held it nearly a hundred years since the first crusade the third crusade was the greatest of all on a larger scale and enticing greater personalities than any other its progress is interesting as showing medieval chivalry at its worst and best its courage and high aims its capacity for endurance its charity and withal its jealousies and bitter hate the crusades had an enormous effect on the general progress of europe but they do not touch the political history of england very nearly except through the financing of richard it was reckless to raise money selling the chancellorship to william longchamp bishop of ely and foregoing for payment the homage which the scotch king had done his father at Falaise. richard was animated by his love of adventure with the added motive of repentance for his conduct towards his father for which he sorrowed in characteristic medieval manner with almost shameless penitence philip augustus his erstwhile ally and now his inevitable rival went too but quarrelled with the english king and soon came back richard stayed and quarrelled still but did marvellous deeds at the siege of acre whence he marched for jerusalem but could not take it for want of support although the frenchmen were as loud in his praise as the english finally the christian secured a footing on the east coast of palestine and access to the holy sepulchre on his way back to england richard was captured by an enemy leopold of austria and handed over to another enemy the emperor henry the sixth england was drained once more to raise his enormous ransom he returned to find his brother john in revolt william of ely had proved a faithful minister to the king but offensive in his ostentation to the barons and john had led resistance to him walter bishop of rouen replaced him but there was no more peace john gave the new minister no loyal support and richard's return found him in alliance with the french king and a design upon the crown john was in normandy and richard having declared his lands forfeit in a great council at nottingham and having had himself recrowned at winchester crossed over to face his brother john came into his allegiance and richard in his grand manner forgave him the french and english kings then gave vent to their public and private grievances against each other in open war in intermittent struggles with the french king or his french vassals fill up the tale of richard's remaining years he devoted himself with enthusiasm to the building of chateau galliard on the rock of andels by sign the saucy castle which was to protect normandy against french invasion it was however in fight against william of limoges over a question of treasure trove that richard met his death from an arrow shot while storming the castle of chalouse richard had the curiosity to question the crossbowman who had let the arrow fly and who had been taken prisoner as to his motive it was he boldly told him revenge for the death of his father and two brothers richard bade his attendants give the man money and let him go but after the king's death his sister countess joan of sicily saw to it that the man was slain richard with his tall fine figure his blue eyes and fair hair with his lordly condescensions and his fine ardours was the most notable prince in europe and the archetype of medieval chivalry he was lettered too and wrote quite reputable poetry in the south french style he asked that his heart might be buried at rouen and his body at his father's feet at font evrod and there it was lain by hugh bishop of lincoln the carthusian saint who had been called from his 
charterhouse to fill that sea he is one of the most striking figures of the period in his gentle asceticism and practical courage though a close friend of the king he had resisted in eleven seventy nine a grant of military service which hubert walker the justiciar who had replaced walter of rouen demanded the exact ground of the resistance is not very clear but hubert's action in defending what he considered englishmen's rights has been held in grateful remembrance it may have been resultant on this refusal that a great survey of england was carried out in the next year by the new common method of inquest it is to be noted that two local knights were added in each county to the body before whom the local jurors swore a remote foreshadowing of the constitution of the parliament whose growth was to be the chief feature of the thirteenth century richard on his deathbed named as his successor his brother john known as lachlan because henry the second had not originally given him a share in his continental possessions as he did to his other sons richard had originally intended that arthur of Brittany, his brother geoffrey's son should secede him but his own premature death found arthur but a boy and richard prevailed on the barons to swear allegiance to john the french king supported arthur but john with the help of his mother eleanor who showed herself as discreet and helpful towards the son she loved as she had been factious with the husband she disliked prevailed and philippe made peace in twelve hundred john's repudiation of his wife isabella of gloucester and his marriage for an amorous whim with isabella of Agoulême, the promised bride of hugh of louison alienated the french king once more and with his support arthur made a new attempt to seize john's french possessions he was taken prisoner in april twelve o three died in the new tower at rouen no one doubted that he was murdered and john's french subjects quite alienated made no further resistance to the french king john sat feasting at rouen in the spring of twelve o four with his wife while philippe annexed normandy boasting in a mad way that what was lost so easily could be as easily won back anjou was taken as easily and later Porteau. within two years nothing remained to the english king of his father's vast possessions in france but guyon and southern aquitaine the gascons were as foreign to france as they were to the english and preferred the more distant rule and so remained under english rule for two and a half centuries longer the loss of the battle of bovines in twelve thirteen put the final seal on the loss of john's french possessions the defeat was due to the failure of the emperor otto the fourth to cooperate in john's well-conceived plan for john was no mean strategist in the periods of energy which alternated with his curious moods of indifferent luxury the final severance came approximately at the moment when an ultimatum prepared by the leaders of the church and the baronage was ready for presentation to john as a protest in the name of all the people against his misrule from twelve o four onwards john had perforce spent most of his time in england he combined the indifference of richard to england's welfare with some of the positive personal vices shamelessly avowed which had marked rufus his tyranny was not unlike that of the red king allowing for the march of time but there was an element of gross cruelty in john which made his misrule more monstrous he slowly starved to death the wife and son of william de raus the first baron who rose against him and he had twenty-eight youths left as hostages by welch princes their fathers hanged in a row discontent was first aroused by his continual levying of scottages and tallages with which he performed no public service he alienated the church by his defiance of the interdict which the great pope innocent laid upon the land when john on the death of hubert walter obstinately refused to accept as archbishop of canterbury innocent's nominee stephen langton the quarrel between the king and the chapter of canterbury over their respective nominees had given the chance for papal interference and the greatest of all the popes was not the one to prove diffident in interference 
after two years of menace england was put under interdict in march twelve o eight the churches were closed and no services held or sacraments administered except baptism and extreme unction allowed for the safety of souls most of the higher clergy fled dreading the reprisals of the king who enriched himself with vast confiscations of the church's goods and lands for five years john held his wayward course and then suddenly demoralized by the pope's sentence of deposition whose execution he entrusted to the french king he rendered to innocent a grovelling submission through the legate pandolf the french fleet lying at dam ready for the invasion of england was destroyed but the english nobles would not follow john to france to follow up the victory stephen langdon landed in england absolved the king and tendered to him the coronation oaths again john had done well to keep stephen out of england for he proved a great patriot he was an englishman probably a northerner and in so far his leadership of the opposition to the king's misrule typifies the consolidation of the norman and english races which had been a steady process under the angevin rule stephen's first act was to assemble the barons and read them a lecture with the charter of henry i as text they decided to take it as their watchword meanwhile the battle of beauvaines was fought and lost and john returned to england full of angry plans of revenge against the barons who had refused to follow him he mustered his mercenaries meanwhile the opposition presented their ultimatum he must confirm the charter of henry i it is significant that neither richard nor john had found it necessary to issue a charter at their accession john tried to foil them by meaningless negotiations through langton who did not openly join the rising at easter twelve fifteen a baronial army under five earls mustered at stamford and marched upon london the citizens received them with open arms and john drew off to windsor at running meet near by he was forced to set his hand to magna carta the famous great charter of english liberty in which langton and his advisers had striven to formulate all the grievances under which the nation groaned a committee of twenty-five barons was to be elected to enforce its provisions a clause significant of the faith given to john's promise in point of fact he never meant to keep it after the thing had been done and the barons had withdrawn he writhed on the ground in an agony of rage shrieking hysterically that they had given him five and twenty over kings he shortly obtained from innocent absolution from his promise the barons desperate to fly the pope's threats of excommunication and took the false step of inviting louis the son of the french king to england to lead their cause this gave john a party from may to october twelve sixteen they fought when john's sudden death ended the struggle and made a rearrangement of parties possible the king had narrowly escaped drowning in crossing the wash where he lost his treasure and angry and exhausted he persisted in eating fruit and drinking cider to his own destruction he was buried in the church of st wolfston at worcester and his memory remains most odious among english kings the great charter which he had signed became the rallying point for a new age a long document of over sixty clauses it has been traditionally regarded as summing up the principles of english liberty and as being adequate for the interpretation of the nation's rights at any period in point of fact it is little but a feudal document and the rights it would enforce were feudal rights its very minuteness illustrates this it was a charter of liberties rather than of liberty it provided against the king's misuse of his feudal rights over his tenants the kernel of a wider liberty is only discerned in the stipulation that they in their turn were to do likewise towards their vassals the liberties enumerated do not touch the face of the great mass of englishmen who were still villeins the church was to have its freedom freedom that is from royal encroachments whereas it was the papal power which was growing in this century and resented in the next from some points of view the great charter had a retrograde aspect 
inasmuch as it sought to check the growth of royal justice in short if it is to be accepted as one of the three great charters in the bible of the english constitution it is because englishmen have read into it the hidden significance of an inspired text end of chapter three chapter four of england in the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org england in the middle ages by elizabeth o'neill the beginnings of the constitution twelve sixteen through thirteen o nine the limitations to the effects of the great charter on its own age finds ample illustration in the history of the years which follow the opposition to john had shown some faint beginnings of national rather than english feeling the foreign character of the classes who made history is emphasized by the story of misrule in the long reign of john's son henry the third from twelve sixteen to twelve seventy two the opposition however which at length put an end to the king's misrule had in it a very definite english element and serves to show how through the progress of years that race was coming into some degree of political power henry the third though born and bred in england was a foreigner in feeling perhaps more so than his father he was personally attractive handsome and well made like his father gentle and suave almost to weakness though occasionally in anger he showed himself the son of john when he came to power he attempted to model his rule of england on the system of the french kings controlling the government himself and working it through a class of clerks able but undistinguished mere routine workers this was not unlike the system of henry the second but his grandson was cast in a different mould henry the third had not the practical ability to carry out his ideal and the result was a disorder which reproduced in effect if not in spirit the tyranny of a rufus or a john but all this was not yet henry was but nine years of age at his father's death a reaction in favour of the national king was inevitable the aged william marshall earl of pembroke one of the two earls who had clung to john acted as ruler of the young king and reissued the charter in his name the nobles deserted louis one by one moved partly by national feeling and partly by jealousy of the favours he gave to his french followers henry had the weight of the church in rome on his side and the papal legate took a hand in the government louis with his frenchmen were driven from the siege of lincoln castle within six months and so great was the plunder that the battle was known as the fair of lincoln this victory was followed up by a brilliant naval success conducted by the justiciar hubert de berg the story of the engagement allowing for differences in equipment reads like an anticipation of the armada fight the english got the weather gauge in the fashion which becomes traditional in their naval warfare they blinded their enemies with quicklime thrown in their faces down the wind the victory put an end to louis's hopes of invasion and within a month he signed the treaty of lambeth by which he agreed to forego his claims on england william the marshal issued the charter once again with the forest charter which john had promised for the future fines or banishment were to replace death or mutilation as punishment for a breach of the forest laws and thus the bitterest grievance which the norman conquest had brought to englishmen was ended the marshal now turned his energies to restore order in the land which was threatened with a repetition of the conditions of stephen's reign adultering castles had to be destroyed and usurpations of royal justice wrested from local magnates william died in twelve nineteen and the work was taken up by hubert de burgh with the loyal support of pandolf who had come a second time to england as papal legate in those years no one attempted to deny the suzerainty which innocent had won and england was frankly worked as a papal fief 
it was one of the great faults in henry's government when he came to his own that he never had the stamina or the inclination to resist the demands of the pope hubert continued the work of the marshal he had most trouble with the nobles of the loyalist party who had hoped much from the rule of a minor often an army had to be led against a defiant baron in 1224 fox de brote one of john's mercenary leaders who had done splendid service at lincoln held bedford castle obstinately against the whole shire levy the castle was surrendered after two months and the fox fled overseas it was a salutary example and marks an end of disorder arising from this source in twelve twenty three the pope had declared henry of age but this was merely a move to make the king's friends disgorge the royal possessions they were holding during the minority in twelve twenty seven he was actually declared of an age to govern and it began with an act of evil augury his angry dismissal of hubert de bourg through the influence of peter de roche the pontivin bishop of winchester and henry's personal guardian even in the marshal's day this act strikes the note of the misrule of the next quarter of a century henry had all the weak man's obstinacy in following his own inclinations he liked frenchmen and england in those years suffered what was practically an alien invasion peter des roches was made justiciar and potivens alone stood high in the king's favour peter induced henry to give to his friend peter of revolt nineteen out of the thirty-five english sheriftons in twelve thirty five the new archbishop of canterbury edmund rich a scholar and a saint induced henry by threats of excommunication to banish peter and his friends henry did not appoint any more justiciars in the old sense and gradually the office became merely that of chief justice he occupied himself with vast schemes which never came to anything justice was delayed and money frittered away with no result henry soon fell back again on foreign favourites and various hordes successively planted themselves on english soil there were first the family and the innumerable relations of his mother isabella of angouleme who married after john's death hugh of lusignan in twelve thirty seven henry married eleanor of provence and a host of provencals and savoyards followed her to england even the archbishopric of canterbury was prostituted at edmund's death to one of these boniface of savoy an illiterate and quite worldly young man hardly distinguished at first from the throng of foreign favourites was simon de montfort grandson of amicia countess of leicester his father the elder simon had supported philippe augustus against john and had forfeited the earldom of leicester he also distinguished himself in the campaign against heresy in the south of france the younger simon came to england in twelve thirty got back the earldom and in twelve thirty eight married the king's sister eleanor for four years from twelve forty eight he performed the ungrateful task of governing gascony henry had been defeated by the french king in poitou in twelve forty two and was at his wit's end to curb resistance in gascony when monfort took over its government and kept order with a strong hand henry carped at his rule in his distrustful way and the earl having finished the task of imposing order gave up his governorship he soon definitely put himself on the side of the opposition which had been steadily growing and which came to a head about this time the church or its better members was as opposed to henry's system as was the baronage the papacy had drained it all through the reign even henry at one point protested at the scale on which money was wrung from the church to support the papacy in its great duel against the hohenstaufen emperors but for the most part he acquiesced in the papal exactions the papal countenance of the alien invasion of the english church by henry's friends indeed made this necessary gross test the famous bishop of lincoln and friend of simon de montfort had opposed the abuse for years but his standard of loyalty to the pope 
the standard which was commonly accepted by the thirteenth century church hampered his action the foolish action of henry in accepting for his second son edmund the crown of sicily confiscated from the hohenstaufen crystallized the opposition the king was to pay immense subsidies to win the kingdom which merely meant that the english were to continue to subsidize the papacy on a larger scale than before the barons in 1258 at a meeting at oxford which the king's partisans called the mad parliament notified the king that they were about to take measures to reform his government a committee of twenty-four was chosen to draft a plan of reform twelve of these were chosen by the king and it is significant that he chose six churchmen four aliens and two of his relatives the opposition twelve contained but one churchman and one alien simon de montfort it was a curious chance that made a foreigner the heart and soul of the national opposition and in spite of the arbitrariness and harshness which mingled with his better qualities and which the next few years were to emphasize there can be no doubt that simon's sympathies were really national and not merely baronial it may be that he saw that the only firm foundation from which to check the royal tyranny was a lower stratum than had yet acceded to political power there is of course still the question whether this realization did more credit to his head or his heart the twenty-four drew up the provisions of oxford transferring the government to a standing council of fifteen with various other advisory committees the conception of limited monarchy which had thus gained acceptance showed a great advance on the provisions of the great charter the limited number of commissioners made for efficiency and a certain amount of reforming work was done such as the removal of royal officers and the changing of the sheriffs the foreigners for the most part fled soon however dissension broke out among the leaders of the opposition it was rumoured that robert of gloucester was jealous of earl simon the young prince of wales edward was in those days receiving splendid schooling and statesmanship hitherto a thoughtless boy he seems to have been sobered and matured by the shock of the opposition already he was forming a policy and during the absence of both simon and his father in twelve fifty nine he pressed the oligarchy to proceed with their task the result was the reforms described in the provisions of westminster in twelve sixty simon and edward made a kind of alliance against the party of gloucester who adopted an attitude of loyalty to the king the situation was but momentary edward and his father were really firm friends and were easily reconciled by richard of cornwall the king's brother who had throughout the reign exerted a wise and sober influence over henry henry was however encouraged to obtain papal absolution from his promises it was but natural that when the struggle reopened edward should be found on his father's side it was broken a moment by the agreement to submit the question as to whether the provisions were binding to the king of france the great statesman crusader and aesthetic st louis in spite of his great qualities louis's view was bounded by the outlook of the autocratic monarchy which the french kings had built up he found the provisions invalid and derogatory simon in his turn proved false to his pledges and refused to be bound by the mise of amiens it weakened his party but richard of gloucester was now dead and simon had the loyal support of his son the young earl gilbert simon's own four sons were greedy and ambitious fighting largely for their own hand at first when the struggle reopened in twelve sixty four the royalist party had the advantage but they were no match for simon in the open field on fourteenth may he won the great battle of Luz, and both the king and prince were taken prisoner next day the king accepted the mise of Luz, promising to uphold the provisions of oxford simon repeated the tactics of twelve fifty eight but this time three electors himself gilbert of gloucester and the bishop of chichester nominated a governing council of nine who were to be supervised for a time by their electors 
it was not even baronial government but government by a party and it meant the dictatorship of simon the royalists regarded the settlement merely as a truce simon in twelve sixty five called together his great parliament in which for the first time burgesses from cities and towns were summoned as well as knights of the shire to take part in the nation's councils there were several precedents for the summoning of knights of the shire the thing was in the air even john had called them once but the extension of the popular element was a stroke of genius even if it was but a bid for popularity this parliament was however but an experiment and contained the germ of the later house of commons but that is all the measure gives us a glimpse into the mind of the man who was striving for a great cause against impossible odds the great leader was in a false position and earl gilbert was alienated by the attitude of montfort's sons prince edward escaped and formed a party and the young earl of gloucester went over to him they led an army against simon's remnant at evensham and with odds of seven to one the battle was but a massacre simon fell with his son henry and many of his closest friends the king who had been led into the battle by his side was wounded and nearly killed in the confusion earl simon's body was buried at the grey father's at evensham but his head was sent to the wife of roger mortimer the marches lord who had been his great enemy it was made a punishable crime to proclaim him a holy man for he had died under the ban of the church but he received a popular if not papal canonization he was after all a great patriot and it was a true instinct which led the people to honour his memory his policy triumphed for it was assimilated by the future king henry was old and broken edward full of a wisdom beyond his years and after the earl's death though there was still some fighting and the disinherited held out for many months at kenilworth a settlement was achieved the dictum of kenilworth at the end of twelve sixty six left their estates to the rebels but exacted heavy fines a year later the statute of marble reenacted the provisions of westminster the government was taken over into the hands of tried bureaucrats and the king was content that it should be so in twelve seventy edward felt that he might safely join king louis who was going on to crusade for the second time louis died on the way but edward pressed on to raise the siege of acre a lurid light is shed on the passions of the time in the murder of henry of germany son of richard of cornwall attacked by guy and simon de montfort while hearing mass at uterbo having turned back from the crusade they mangled his body in revenge for the mutilation their father had suffered after evensham edward was summoned home from the crusade but too late to see his father before he died on sixteenth november twelve seventy two after a reign of enormous length during a time which had seen much distress and disorder in political life but which had been after all of great period for the policy of this king with the heart of wax could not stem the tide of a civilization swelling to the full it is a relief to turn from the political story to consider other aspects of the time europe was in a state of intellectual and moral ferment of which the crusading movement was but one manifestation new figures and new institutions expressing new ideals or the perfection of old ones crowd the canvas of european history early in henry's reign the grey friars followers of saint francis the poor man of assisi and black friars disciples of the noble spanish canon dominic landed in england to put their peculiar impress on her ecclesiastical and social life the monks had done great social and economic service but the time was right for a new manifestation the face of england was still mainly agricultural but the towns had been steadily growing and with them those contrasts of wealth and poverty which seemed the inevitable accompaniments of civic life the processes of borough development varied but the commonest type was the towns which had grown up through the association of specialized artisans and traders 
to supply the more luxurious needs of a great lord or corporation as the standard of living rose at first their tenure was merely futile but they gradually won for themselves the power of self-government the crusades gave an immense impetus to this movement when needy nobles bartered their feudal power for gold in some towns and more especially in london which had won from richard the right to choose its mayor a considerable alien population engaged in trade gave color and variety most of the towns too had their jewelry where behind their walls the jews lived a proscribed and peculiar people they enjoyed royal protection such as it was for an age which had not yet learnt to discount the church's condemnation of usury the jew was the only money lender ever and anon the suppressed hatred with which the christian regarded the jew broke control and massacres and lootings of their quarters form a characteristic phase of medieval life in england generally a panic rumour was the cause when some lost child was supposed to have been kidnapped and crucified by the jews at their obscene festivals the dominicans under henry the third strove to convert them but it was a forlorn hope and under edward the first when their functions could be supplied by italian bankers they were driven from the realm to the number of over sixteen thousand no jew had henceforth the right to set foot in england till cromwell's day the jewries consisted often of substantial and well-built houses but it was in the crowded suburbs outside the walls of the town where narrow streets of rough cottages crowded upon one another that the begging friars found their work it was part of the franciscan asceticism to tend the ill and leprous but they and the black friars did their best work in preaching to the people in in racy idiomatic phrases which must have contrasted vividly from the old stereotyped and infrequent sermons of the parish priests the friars seemed to introduce a lively element into english life which helps to break up the oriental passivity which had marked the lower classes of englishmen in strong contrast to the vivid adventure and change which had been long the lot of their superiors the friar sermons were probably responsible for the introduction of words of foreign origin into spoken english and they accelerated the movement by which the english tongue had all through the angevin period been becoming in a minor way once more a literary language it was an oxford friar who voiced in english verse the gratitude of the people to earl simon the friars too found favor among the great ones of the land the cultivated franciscan adam marsh was the friend and spiritual adviser of earl simon but gravely held aloof from political strife the scholarly dominicans and the franciscans too in spite of their founders distrust of books did much toward the development of those other most characteristic institutions of the thirteenth century the universities already in the twelfth century there had been a tendency to erect in european centres where masters taught and students thronged corporations of teachers with rigid rules and privileges the oxford schools had been active and distinguished since the days of henry the second in twelve fourteen the university came into being formed on the model of paris for if thirteenth century ideals were cosmopolitan they found their highest expression in france hitherto paris had claimed those english youths who were most greedy for knowledge now oxford and in a minor way cambridge held their own though the great battles of the scholasticism which the century made perfect were fought in paris and the oxford scholars often proceeded later to the more distinguished university the friars built large plain churches convenient for preaching but the time saw an immense development in gothic architecture which was perhaps now at its best combining a new lightness with the early plainness henry himself was a great builder he rebuilt the east end of westminster abbey round the new tomb of the confessor which he brought skilled workmen from italy to make the king in spite of his foreign leanings had a great devotion to the english saints and he called his sons by english names one of his great interests was the decoration of his houses and chapels and many of his schemes remained to testify to his fine taste in colour and design the age was full of colour 
dress especially now took on a greater richness in material and ornament though the old flowing simple styles were not altered it is in this and in the decorative arts which supplement architecture that the infallible judgment of the age in matters of artistic taste is best shown it is curious to reflect that this passionate love of beautiful things was combined with the utmost squalor in domestic arrangements this is however but one of the violent contrasts of which the time is full and which make it fascinating edward i who came to the english throne at the full tide of the medieval period was a very typical medieval and perhaps the greatest of our early kings in appearance he was an ideal king handsome and well made towering above ordinary men by a head and shoulders he had inherited the curious droop of one eyelid which had slightly marred his father's face he spoke with a stammer but engagingly he was the first king since the conquest with an english name and he was also the first who seceded without any form of election his reign was dated officially from the day after his father's death edward did not land in england until two years later meanwhile making a stay in gascony which as usual required to be put in order and at paris where he did homage to the french king for his duchy things were quiet in england but much work awaited edward on his return in the first part of his reign he issued a great series of laws which crystallized the reforming tendencies of the age he had learnt much from earl simon on many subjects and he eventually brought into permanent existence a wider parliamentary representation recalling in his model parliament of twelve ninety five the precedent of simon's parliament thirty years earlier not too much credit must be given to edward for this he had a true love for his people but he was a man of his time and there was no really democratic ideal in the middle ages edward loved power and clung to it but he also loved efficiency he needed much money for his enterprises and he realized that efficient taxation must be accompanied by adequate representation which he plausibly translated for the popular benefit into the maxim of roman law that what touches all should be approved by all nevertheless his definition of the constitution of parliament is a great feature of the reign subsequent parliaments contain the shire and borough representatives and also representatives of the lower clergy at first the estates voted separately it was some forty years before two houses were formed the representatives of the lower clergy had soon fallen away preferring to make their money grants in convocation the knights and burgesses drew together to form the house of commons acting separately from the upper house it was a feature of english as distinguished from continental society that there was no rigid division between gentry and traders the younger sons of gentlemen frequently drifted into the ranks of trade and eventually the reverse process became possible the burgesses who were now admitted to parliament were of course englishmen and though they may not have appreciated their privileges as much as posterity has done for them the fact proves the growing importance of englishmen in national life the first twenty years of the reign saw a great series of statutes the first parliament passed in twelve seventy five the first statute of westminster dealing especially with details which might ensure sound administration it also provided a regular revenue for the king by granting him the custom on wool wool fells and leather no later as the great and ancient custom the statute of gloucester in twelve seventy eight instituted inquiries under the writ quo warranto into the innumerable petty immunities and private jurisdictions which the barons had won largely at the expense of the hundred courts mostly merely by the growth of custom so bitter was the baronial feeling on this subject that edward had to allow prescriptive rights to stand but he took care to have a written record made and no new immunities of the sort were possible this was but one aspect of edward's policy of eliminating feudalism from political life in twelve ninety the statute quia emptores checked the process of sub infeudation and so acted in the same direction for the future persons receiving a grant of land must hold it 
from the original lord so that in time quite poor men became tenants in chief and one of the main ideas of feudalism was rendered an absurdity on the other hand edward instituted the system of entail which has preserved a feudal element in the tenure of land to our own day edward's attitude to the church was consistent with his general policy though a loyal son of the church he was anxious for national control the archbishops of his time the franciscan peckham and winchelsea were englishmen but they and especially the former were full of the papalist ideas of hildebrand and innocent peckham indeed would sometimes have entrenched on royal authority but edward was watchful and the archbishop was no becket the statute of mortmain checked the passing of land into the dead hand of the church for the continuity of corporations deprived the lord of such feudal perquisites as wardships edward also defined strictly the jurisdiction of the church courts edward's national policy had one other notable aspect he was bent on the conquest of wales and scotland anticipating a natural political union which was not to be achieved for another three centuries wales included the marches ruled by norman lords and what later became the principality in the north ruled by native princes the welsh prince llewellyn ab Grudith, had supported earl simon and had won cardigan and carmarthen his power was so great that in twelve sixty seven henry had recognized him officially as prince of wales success seems to have distorted his political vision and he thought it possible to refuse homage to edward who therefore in twelve seventy seven invaded wales and locked up llewellyn's army in snowdon the welsh prince was defeated his southern conquests forfeited and he himself reduced to a very close dependence on the english king who for five years strove to impose the english system of government on the principality the celtic customs died hard and in twelve eighty two a general rising stirred the land david llewellyn's brother who had submitted to edward and received lands in the marches took part in it llewellyn was killed at orwin bridge in december twelve eighty two and three months later david was hunted down in the fastnesses of snowdon and died the disgraceful death of a traitor the english system was rigidly imposed and some forlorn revolts easily suppressed in thirteen o one edward's only surviving son and his namesake was invested with the principality but the welsh ever felt themselves a race apart as the rebellion under owen glendower a century later showed edward's attempts to conquer scotland fill the last years of his reign he had a unique opportunity when in twelve eighty six the maid of norway died on her way to scotland to be made queen the scotch consented to leave the decision between the rights of the thirteen claimants to edward as suzerain of scotland he decided in favor of john Balloy, who was accordingly crowned king but he and the scotch resented very soon the interpretation which edward put on his suzerainty the feudal bond to england which had from time to time been acknowledged by scottish kings had been very loose in fact merely nominal edward by encouraging appeals from the scotch courts to westminster and by his general attitude threatened to make it a real subjection Balloy in 1295 made a league with the new king of france philippe the fourth who unlike his predecessor was unfriendly to edward and had the year before tricked him out of his duchy of guienne with the grants made by the model parliament edward equipped himself for the invasion of scotland he carried all before him the lords did him homage and he deposed Balloy. he left a lieutenant to administer scotch law but on the startling news of the successful revolt of the scotch under william wallace a renfrewshire knight edward invaded scotland a second time and won the battle of falkirk by the tactics dating from hastings of combining a cavalry attack with showers of arrows but edward could not follow up his victory through distractions elsewhere in twelve ninety nine his first wife eleanor and mother of thirteen of his children having died nine years before 
he married for political convenience the french king's sister and so got Gascony back again the two kings joined in resistance to the abnormal claims of pope boniface the eighth which philippe was to follow up with violence removing the seat of the papacy to avignon in 1305 thus beginning the babylonian captivity of the popes in 1303 edward turned again to scotland and in 1305 wallace was captured and executed and scotland seemed to be conquered once more but the next year her cause found its most heroic defender in robert bruce grandson of the chief rival of john Beloy. weary but indomitable at the age of seventy edward was on the march once more to scotland when he died at berg on sands seventh july thirteen o seven edward's eager prosecution of his schemes in france and scotland had led him into conflicts with his subjects which give us the measure of his constitutionalism preparing for a great expedition to france in twelve ninety seven he levied a heavy customs duty on wool and even laid hands on wool ready for shipping this maltolt was bitterly resented and when edward and flanders sent home for more money next year parliament made a grant but coupled with it a petition that the king would confirm the charters and that henceforth no maltolts or taxes not legally granted should be raised the king swore an oath to observe this and the incident marks an advance in the power of parliament the chief nobles had refused to follow the king overseas in their feudal capacity and edward definitely waived his claim to demand such service much of the nobles went with him as stipendaries but the earls of norfolk and hereford refused even this and it was they joined with archbishop winchelsea who led the movement against edward's irregular taxation obviously there was a fractious element archbishop winchelsea was incensed against edward for his outlawry of the clergy in twelve ninety six when they in accordance with the famous bull of boniface clericis lacos refused to make the king any grant in his time of need edward was naturally incensed at the claim to exempt the ecclesiastical lands from taxation finally a compromise was made by which the clergy made a voluntary gift to the king and were inlawed on edward's return to england the opposition pressed for the formal confirmation of the charters edward evaded the question with great dexterity but consented in thirteen hundred to certain articuli super cartas which formed in effect a confirmation the spectacle of the founder of our modern parliament having these to us elementary principles of constitutional government thrust upon him is instructive edward resented it bitterly and as like many paragons of medieval chivalry he interpreted a promise by the letter rather than the spirit in spite of his motto keep truth he obtained papal absolution from his oaths but kept them our sympathies go out to him in his eager pursuit of his great aims and the virtue of his kingship is attested by the contrast of the years which follow End of chapter 4chapter 5 of England in the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. England in the Middle Ages by Elizabeth O'Neill. A Century of Unrest. 1307 through 1399. The story of the twenty years' reign of Edward's son, Edward of Carnarvon, shows how great a part the personality of the king still played in the English system. It is a sordid, yet withal tragic tale. The new king was almost as handsome and fine a man physically as his father, but utterly unlike him in character he had not even the frivolous seriousness of henry the third he frankly disliked the duties of kingship and would refer matters of state to his good brother piers his favoritism to this piers gaveston a gascon who had been practically his foster-brother was bitterly resented 
Edward sent his father's body to Westminster, in spite of his request that it should be carried with the army to victory over the Scots. There was no such victory. Robert Bruce carried all before him, while Edward left the languid pursuit of the war to others. In 1314, public opinion forced him to march north to defend Stirling, the last great stronghold in English hands. The result was the great Scotch victory at Bannockburn, which decided Scotland's independence throughout the Middle Ages, a fact which Edward had to recognize by a formal truce ten years later. Edward hated war and had no knowledge of tactics. His method was a blind onslaught with his men-at-arms, his archery being wasted. The loss of Scotland formed but one element in Edward's unpopularity, which had grown steadily throughout his reign. The great nobles early formed an opposition, and that it proved so long futile was due to the fact that it was a baronial rather than a national resistance and the day of the great baronage was really over in the political sense. The leader was Earl Thomas of Lancaster, a violent and passionate man, relentless to resist but powerless to construct, the richest and greediest of all the English earls. Gaveston, who was not incompetent, and was certainly brave in spite of his frivolity, had been banished by Edward I. Twice again he was sent out of England, but always came back, in 1311 the old device of the reforming committee was revived twenty-one lords ordainers were appointed to reform the realm by their ordinances the king was put in tutelage the ordainers drew up a list of reforms but gave their attention chiefly to revenge gaveston was captured and withdrawn from the hands of justice by the earl of warwick whom he had nicknamed the black dog he was summarily beheaded and Edward had to forgive the outrage, and was then given once more some degree of power. The defeat at Bannockburn made Edward very unpopular, and Lancaster practically seized the royal power for four years, but accomplishing nothing, lost the support of the nobles. Edward had now another chance. He gave his favors to Hugh Dispenser, a great baron and bitter enemy of Lancaster and to the younger dispenser of the same name. With their help, the baronial opposition was broken up, and Lancaster, taken in battle, was beheaded. He was the least worthy of the series of men who were reputed saints by popular acclamation. For he was no true patriot, and had not even ability to justify his ambition. The dispensers now ruled for Edward, but were ever seeking their own hand. The time was ripe for a new opponent, and such as one was found in the king's own household. He had wedded in 1308 Isabella, the twelve-year-old daughter of the French king, and had consistently neglected her, not the most amiable of wives. After a quarrel, she was foolishly allowed to cross on an embassy to her brother, Charles IV. She got possession of the person of the young Prince Edward. She was joined by Roger Mortimer, a friend of Earl Thomas, and her secret paramour with an army they landed in england and the baronage rallied to them the two dispensers fled but were caught and executed edward was forced to abdicate in favour of his son on the twentieth of january thirteen twenty seven and some months later was foully done to death in his prison at berkeley castle he was perhaps the most worthless of our kings for if he had not the malice neither had he the ability of john the tragedy of his fate is rendered more wretched by the sordid aims and unworthy character of his opponents. For three years Mortimer and Isabella ruled England in their own interest, then the young king seized power. Mortimer was executed at Tyburn for the murder of the king, and Isabella retired into private life. The strength of character of the boy of eighteen who affected this coup de main is obvious, Edward the Third, in his long reign of half a century, showed himself in many ways the worthy grandson of Edward the First. He resembled his father and grandfather in physical type. Like Edward the First, he was full of great projects, schemes indeed impossible to carry out. Yet the aims of the first Edward were more feasible. His grandson took but little interest in Scotland, and concentrated his efforts on an attempt to conquer France. 
He was a great soldier, but not a great general. The period saw brilliant victories, but ill-conceived campaigns, and when all is said, the attempt bore little fruit in territorial gain, but it effected very considerable constitutional development in England. Edward was the very type of 14th century knighthood, which differed in a subtle way from that of the 13th century. There was more of show and less simplicity, less violence perhaps, but the new refinement covered a more essential coarseness. There was a new suavity in men's relations to each other, which partly arose from frivolity. Thus it is that while Edward the Third resembled his grandfather in many ways, his personality made a different impression of unreality and insincerity. Yet Edward was quite as much a constitutional king as Edward I. In fact, he yielded more easily on many points, partly from indifference, his mind being set on other things. Yet Edward did not begin the Hundred Years' War with France as a mere knightly experiment. The time was ripe for such a struggle. France was being at last welded into a nation, and the English possessions in the south were an anomaly. Force and guile had been repeatedly used to wrest them from the English kings, and the great war was really fought to decide the perennial dispute. There were minor causes of quarrel. The French king had helped the Scotch resistance to Edward Balloy, whom Edward had supported in the beginning of his reign, in his seizure of the Scotch crown during the minority of David Bruce. Balliol's concessions to the English king lost him his popularity and his crown, and the reinstatement of David marks the beginning of the alliance between France and Scotland, which was to outlast the Middle Ages. Moreover, there were constant bickerings on the narrow seas between English and French sailors. Philippe the Sixth was supporting his vassal the Count of Flanders in his attack on the great clothing towns, which were the chief market for English wool. Nevertheless, the spoken cause of the war was Edward's claim to the French throne, a claim which only the indeterminateness of medieval laws of secession made less ridiculous to that day than it is to ours. It would be impossible here to describe the process of the war. It was declared in 1337, and Edward made expensive and fruitless raids in the north of France against an enemy which would not fight him in the open. In 1340, the English won a great naval battle at Sluys, the French fleet, which had been prepared to invade England, being annihilated. The fight was one of the steps in the building up of England's great naval tradition, but the battle was fought as a land battle, the ships grappling and the men engaging in hand-to-hand -hand fight. French opposition by sea was nullified for twenty years. A dispute over the Breton secession gave Edward another foothold in France, but it was not till 1346 when he abandoned allied troops and led an English army into the very heart of France that he achieved success. Marching on Paris, he was intercepted by the French king at Crecy and won a brilliant victory by the tactics which became traditional, the combination of men-at-arms on foot with longbow archers. It was a democratic formation, and it became traditionally successful against the heavy and immobile aristocratic cavalry of france it was symbolical of the national development which england had achieved in contrast with the feudalism which still dominated society in france calais was captured before the end of the campaign and the next few years were marked by a series of truces in 1355 edward's eldest son the black prince who had won his spurs at crecy made a great raid through Languedoc, and in the next autumn led an army ravaging towards the Loire. He was met at Poitiers by an army under the new French King John. The French seemed to have made an attempt to copy the English tactics, but their armies were incorrigibly aristocratic. The English won a great victory, and King John was taken prisoner. With the truce theatrically of the 14th century knight, the prince waited personally on him at table. King John came in honorable bondage to England, and though he went back once to France, when it was seen that she could not raise his ransom, he came back again and died a prisoner. The mere sketch of the war can give no idea of the misery it brought to France. 
full of revolt and unrest the effects of the black death felt all over europe were aggravated there by the ravages of the englishman and all the miseries which war brings in thirteen sixty by the peace of Brittany, edward who never meant his claim to the throne to be taken seriously formally renounced it but the duchy of aquitaine in its largest interpretation equal to half of france south of the loire was formally yielded up to him as well as calais the duchy was placed under the government of the black prince who had won it in thirteen sixty four charles v became king of france an abler man than his father the black prince found aquitaine in its swollen form hard to hold and when in thirteen sixty nine he went to spain to win victories for the unworthy pedro the cruel his french subjects appealed to the french king against his taxation war broke out again the black prince returning ill from spain could no longer lead it he strove however in the south while john of gaunt his younger brother repeated edward's earlier raiding policy in the north in thirteen seventy the black prince stained his record by sacking limoges the chief town of the small district he had reconquered it was a characteristic act of medieval cruelty motivated by ungovernable passion he returned incapacitated to england and died in thirteen seventy seven his father had fallen into decrepitude old like many medievals at sixty during the next five years england lost all she had won in france the year thirteen seventy five found the victor of cresci suing for peace he claimed a truce meanwhile depressed and broken in body and spirit edward had fallen on evil days at home his reign had seen a steady development in the power of the commons for edward had needed immense funds and this was always the nation's opportunity it was becoming increasingly difficult for the king to live of his own as expenses increased feudal aids were dwindling and the profits from the royal domain and royal justice were inadequate the king had the ancient customs and tried by separate negotiations with the merchants to extend his profits in this direction in thirteen forty edward conceded that no charge or aid should be imposed henceforth without the consent of parliament twice later parliament checked the growth of indirect taxation by forbidding any charge to be set upon wool without its consent moreover under edward all evasiveness in meeting the parliament's petition was made impossible they took the form of bills to which the king must answer definitely with consent or refusal a certain advance was made in the direction of appropriation of supplies when money was definitely granted for the pursuance of the french war edward even conceded to parliament the right to audit the national accounts though this concession was made in the spirit of much of his compliance and became a dead letter the control of parliament over the executive hardly existed though in the criticisms of the good parliament at the end of the reign a beginning was made even here the commons seemed to have been genuinely loath to give advice on foreign policy and even when consulted excused themselves as too simple and ignorant to give counsel on such the last few years of the reign when edward had fallen into senile decay saw much corruption and maladministration two parties opposed each other in the state the quarrel partook of the nature of a family dispute but had some of the notes of a constitutional struggle the chief man who had power with the king was his son john of gaunt earl of lancaster the chief woman was alice perers a mistress of a low type queen philippa had died in thirteen sixty nine many motives combined towards the unpopularity of john of gaunt there was the failure of the french war which he could not help he was hated by the churchmen for he was tainted if not with a new heresy which was filling men's minds with wonder certainly with anti-clericalism he had caused the dismissal of the king's clerical ministers in thirteen seventy one and william of wykenham bishop of winchester the famous patron of learning who had been chancellor was one of his chief opponents john of gaunt was not a bad man but he was ambitious beyond his abilities 
and he had certainly given countenance to the unworthy dependents who surrounded edward the opposition to his influence came to a head in the good parliament of thirteen seventy six it had the support of the black prince who died while it was in session it presented a hundred and forty petitions and though none of its work was put into permanent form the claims it put forward remain on record and formed a valuable precedent it fell back on the old device of appointing a council of supervision the court was cleared of the worthless favourites but next year john of gaunt was able to pack a parliament through the sheriffs he had already by royal edict declared the acts of the previous parliament null and void he had even brought alice Perrers back and she was there to steal the jewels from the corpse of edward ere it was cold the king died on the twenty first of june thirteen seventy seven the minority of richard the second the black prince's son reads almost like a chapter out of the last years of edward's life after a brief period of retirement john of gaunt had chief influence in the state the government was weak taxation was heavy the french were harrying the very coast of england yet pride forbade a peace forces which had been at work all through the century now exploded the fourteenth century in its social economic and in a minor degree its religious life presents a deep contrast to the centuries which had gone before the passivity which had marked the lower strata of the population gave place to a new self-consciousness which is almost modern indeed the age is full of anticipations of modern things though these must not be overemphasized much which arrests the attention of the historian was but transitory and there was indeed less of this spurious modernity in the next century when the medieval system was indeed fast breaking up the notes of the new unrest are the social and economic agitations partly resultant on the recurrent visitations of the black death and linked with the incipient forces of heresy in religion represented by john wycliffe and his followers the black or foul death was a plague which three times in this century swept over europe from the east decimating populations and causing untold misery to an age which had no sanitary science it came to england in thirteen forty nine thirteen sixty one and thirteen sixty nine the mysterious scourge had created almost as deep an impression on posterity as on its own age but it is not so much a determining as an arresting factor in english economic history it has been estimated that it swept away half the english population which the most generous computation estimates at five millions and the most grudging at two and a half so that even on the more liberal estimate the whole population of england did not equal that of london today it has been estimated that the population of a large borough in the middle ages would be from five hundred to one thousand all told the immediate and obvious consequence of the plague was a scarcity of labor corn ripened and rotted for want of reapers and a general depression threatened the landowners tradition used to tell how these strove to undo a process which had been going on and in fact was almost completed before the visitation the commutation of feudal service for money payment in fact this process had been going on but was far from completed with the depletion of the laborers labor was now becoming more valuable than money but the evidence goes to show that it was the villain rather than the lord who was the innovator in the economic disputes of the period it is hardly thinkable that the landowners could attempt to revive obsolete rights on the other hand the great demand for his labor must have compelled the villain irresistibly to push further the system of commutation moreover the class of paid laborers which had grown up as a natural corollary to commutation demanded higher wages as the market widened in the years following the first visitation of the plague parliament strove with true medieval blindness to the irresistible character of economic forces to stay up the cause of the landowner as against the laborers and to settle the rate of wages throughout the land but in vain the landowners themselves evaded the statutes of laborers and paid the higher rate the process of commutation was hastened rather than retarded for a lord would sometimes commute labor service so as to keep the villain on his holding 
for one effect of the century's unrest was to make the population more mobile the black death really gave a further impetus to forces already at work and the disorganization aided in the growth of the new self-consciousness which marked the times apart from the actual physical misery of sickness the trading and laboring classes profited rather than suffered the former by a general rise in prices the latter by the rise in wages the real sufferers were the landowners who now tended to abandon the old system of farming their demesse through bailiffs and let portions out to tenant farmers who became the common type of the agricultural population thus feudalism which had been practically eliminated from political life became an attenuated element in the economic structure nevertheless the age was full of discontent strange new heretics were seen flagellating themselves in the streets of london john wycliffe at oxford was formulating his dictum that dominion is founded on grace which when it filtered through to the people was translated into bad men should be deprived of their property john ball known as the mad priest of kent was preaching a socialist gospel from the text when adam daft and eve span who was then the gentleman the great medieval english poem piers the ploughman though chiefly a plaint on the moral decay of the age was also quarried for texts the religious element was certainly less marked than the social in the movement among the people it had its counterpart in the anti-clericism of john of gaunt who was a friend of wycliffe the anti-papal legislation which had marked the reign of edward had but a superficial connection with it in thirteen fifty one the statute of provisors forbade papal provision to english benefices and the first statute of primum ire was passed in thirteen fifty three forbidding men to draw out any of the realm in plea a blow aimed at papal jurisdiction a second and more famous statute of pre minore was passed in thirteen ninety three and extended in fourteen hundred but like much medieval legislation they expressed the ideal rather than the practice they form one manifestation of the growing sense of nationalism which was marked by the increasing use of english as their ordinary speech by the upper classes and which was shown in the blank refusal of the papal demand for the arrears of the tribute john had paid yearly to rome the anti-papal policy was partly anti-french for the papal seat being at avignon the popes were more or less under french influence it does not represent in any sense a breaking away from the spiritual authority of rome the new heresy for the most part reached only the lower classes and only a section of them the pent-up excitement of the times found most vivid expression in the peasants revolt of thirteen eighty one the spark which kindled the flame was a heavy poll tax with no adequate gradation of a shilling a head on all adult persons the commissioners who went out to revise the returns were met by risings everywhere they had in them a strange unanimity watchwords passed from village to village and gave an impression of elaborate organization but this is probably delusive the leaders were local agitators and the grievances were local and definite true john ball helped to inspire the kentish rising john wycliffe had sent out his poor priests in thirteen seventy eight to preach a simple gospel life but there is no real evidence that they took any part in the agitation though obviously they form one element the more tempting men from their routine the kentish men who marched upon london complained chiefly of misgovernment their grievances were political in essex and east anglia the social unrest found voice the demand was for freedom from villainage the isolated risings in the towns of the north and west had for the most part their origin in the discontent of the poorer citizens against the rule of an oligarchy the kentish revolt had most prominence the political nature of its aims is emphasized by the fact that the londoners opened their gates to the mob under wat tyler john of gaunt's palace of the savoy was wrecked with many other buildings the boy king rode out to meet wat tyler at mile end and gave the rebels the charters they demanded but tyler who must have been a mere demagogue went back into the city broke into the tower 
murdering the chancellor archbishop sudbury the treasurer and other officials the mob then turned to burning houses and slaying every official they could find completely alienating the neutral population next day the king met them again at smithfield when tyler proposed to him a complete socialist program probably meaning to follow up a refusal with further violence richard a slim handsome boy of fourteen was cool and collected and when tyler threatened one of the king's attendants with his dagger william walworth the mayor struck him dead with his cutlass richard with amazing courage held the bewildered mob in parley while walworth rode back into the city and returned with the militia the rebels seeing themselves caught in a trap and leaderless sulkily dispersed an army marched through essex and the rebels melted away many leaders were hanged john ball among the number parliament declared the king's charters null and void laying stress on the necessity of parliamentary consent to render them valid the revolt is one of the most picturesque incidents in the middle ages but its importance as a historical factor has been exaggerated it may have affected a temporary reaction against the process by which the serfs were becoming free but it was hardly appreciable in the next century serfdom is already an anachronism the general religious excitement too seems to have died down though larledy was a force in the land wycliffe in these years had been developing his doctrine and in his denial of transubstantiation was preaching heresy his teaching was condemned by a council at blackfriars but whether he recanted or not he was allowed to retire to his church at lutterworth where he died while hearing mass two years later john of gaunt threw off from him for he would not countenance open heresy but there was an anti-clerical tone at the court until the end of the reign the wycliffe's followers the lollards were consistently hunted out and imprisoned for three years after the peasants revolt the young king who had shown such precocious judgment was under tutelage when he was emancipated he resented the interference of his uncles john of gaunt went to spain but thomas of woodstock duke of gloucester his younger uncle a factious and unscrupulous man remained richard's complete confidence in michael de la pole later made earl of suffolk and the young noble robert de vere who became duke of ireland was resented one was a wise and neither were bad men but richard was extravagant in the honors he heaped upon them he was lavish too in his expenditure and petulant and resentful of interference the attack which gloucester made was less a constitutional than a factious opposition but richard had to bow to it in thirteen eighty six gloucester by an attack in parliament forced richard to dismiss his ministers and accept a council of control suffolk was impeached that is presented by the house of commons at the bar of the house of lords a process which the good parliament had devised it was imprisoned but released by richard in thirteen eighty seven but gloucester supported by the earls of warwick arundel nottingham and henry of derby john of gaunt's son took up arms and defeated the small royalist army under suffolk at redcott bridge the five lords appealed the king's friends of treason suffolk and oxford fled overseas the merciless parliament found them and others of the king's friends guilty of treason and eight or nine were executed richard with admirable self-control submitted to the inevitable and allowed himself to be subjected to a council the next year he declared himself of an age to rule and chose his own ministers his conduct now was in strong contrast to his levity before he chose william of wykenham as his chancellor and restored the appellants to his council in thirteen ninety this period was marked by wise rule and a constitutional spirit in thirteen ninety six richard made a truce of twenty-five years with france marrying isabella the seven-year-old daughter of the french king his first wife anne of bohemia having died two years before there had been a peculiarly deep affection between the king and his wife and richard was frenzied with grief the new friendship with france marks a turning point in richard's career the whole character of his temper and policy changes 
he may have been bitten with a fever of admiration for the despotism of the french kings and resolved to imitate it or he may have been nursing for eight years the plan of a ghastly revenge either explanation seems inadequate and the psychology of this crisis remains perhaps the greatest mystery in medieval history the suggestion that richard's mind was unhinged is a plausible solution the facts are flagrant enough in the parliament which met in january thirteen ninety seven a member haxey was condemned as a traitor for complaining of court extravagance richard affected to believe that the appellants designed new treason gloucester was arrested sent overseas and murdered at calais the earls of warwick and arundel were executed the archbishop arundel the brother of the earl banished the earls of derby and nottingham had posed recently as friends of richard and were made dukes of hereford and norfolk respectively in the next year a packed parliament delegated its powers to a committee of the king's friends after granting richard a life revenue in the autumn of this year hereford and norfolk were banished from the realm on a frivolous pretext and the king's revenge was complete the action of the parliament was most alarming and the possibility of such submissiveness on the part of the representatives illustrates the limitations of parliamentary development richard seems to have contemplated a despotism very much like that developed later by the tutors but only complete exhaustion made the tutor despotism possible and england was yet to see a century of struggle and experiment richard's rule meanwhile was most arbitrary fines and loans were raised on every side his violent language his argument against his sanity his misrule did not last long while he was absent in ireland in the summer of thirteen ninety nine he was one of the few medieval kings who had any statesmanlike idea of its government henry of derby accompanied by archbishop arundel came back to claim his forfeited duchy of lancaster so many rallied to his cause that he dared more and claimed the throne to himself richard returned hastily but made no adequate resistance he seemed completely confused and demoralized and within three weeks consented to abdicate on condition that his life should be spared and an honourable livelihood granted to him henry of bolingbroke claimed the throne by right of descent and conquest the former ground was impossible for his father was the third son of edward the third and richard's direct heir as he had no children was the child edmund of march descended from lionel duke of clarence edward's second son the claim on the ground of conquest was insulting henry's real strength was that he had the nation at his back worried even of richard's caprice he is the least consistent figure in the role of english kings extravagant even effeminate in his tastes loving the eccentricities of dress which the age developed he yet gives occasional glimpses of seriousness of purpose it is difficult to forget his reckless boy's courage in face of the peasant mob and apart from his revenge on the appellants who had dealt so mercilessly with his friends no act of cruelty can be laid to his charge the pusillanimity of his abdication is almost redeemed by his dignified conviction that he could not put off the ghostly honour of the royal anointing he died within a year probably done to death if not by violence by the more insidious method of privation it is to be noted that the lancastrian revolutions as well as the dynastic struggles of the next century was precipitated by edward the third's policy of gathering up the great earldoms into the hands of members of the royal family he sought to disarm baronial opposition relying on the strength of family feeling he was utterly mistaken the struggles of the fifteenth century were chiefly in the nature of a family quarrel richard was the first victim of the mistake with the accession of henry the fourth begins a new period separated by marked differences from the fourteenth century if the story of that century has loomed in sombre colours it must be remembered that it had other aspects against the melancholy plaints of the authors or authors of piers the ploughman must be set the more perfect poetry of chaucer with its new joyousness and humour which must have had its counterpart somewhere in the national life end of chapter five
Chapter Six of England in the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. England in the Middle Ages by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter Six: The Breakup of the Middle Ages, 1399 to 1485. The 15th century exhibits the worst aspects of the medieval system. Something of idealism redeems the cruelty of the previous centuries, but the new century was marked by a new jealousy and coarseness. The age wears itself out in faction fights in which each man seeks his own hand. The second part of the Hundred Years' War arose not from the national impulses, which form one element in the first part, but as a device of a king hard-pressed at home, anxious to dazzle opponents by his military prowess. It was an age of spurious romance. It achieved the spurious forms of a constitutionalism, which broke down before an equally hollow revivalism of feudalism. It had no genuine literature, but only imitations. Even the flow of Latin chronicles stopped short. Dress was no less splendid than in the previous age, but female dress at least degenerated in design. The time produced a characteristic architecture, beautiful at its best, but with a tendency to overemphasize detail. The chief mark which the incipient Renaissance made on England was an approximation to the violence which characterized the Italian politics of the time. Torture was now first used as part of a legal process, whereas in the true Middle Ages a scrupulous delicacy had forborne to fetter an accused man in court lest this should undermine his self-possession. There were, it is true, side currents towards better things. In 1477, William Caxton set up his printing press in Westminster Sanctuary and produced laboriously beautiful editions of English and Latin works. Yet chief among his patrons was that John Tiptoff, Earl of Worcester, who as constable under Edward the Fourth earned a monstrous reputation for the ruthless doing to death of his political enemies by an unprecedented application of the principles of Roman law which he had learnt at Padua. Besides the suppression of heresy in the earlier period, there is little to relate of church history. Corporations grew rich, and though new monasteries were established the tendency was rather towards the foundation of schools and colleges this quiet and religious life was perhaps not altogether a bad sign and it finds its parallel in that of the people as apart from the nobles trade flourished and the agricultural population was flourishing it is only the upper classes which have a history the age is full of incident, but it is a repetition of incident, and its history is best briefly told in the summary of the tendencies which the details merely serve to illustrate. Henry the Fourth came to the throne as a parliamentary sovereign, and he reigned as the slave of an assembly which had degenerated in its spirit and policy. Henry had great need of funds to quell the opposition which met his rule on every side, the Welsh and Scots were against him. In Wales, Owen Glendower still held out at Henry's death. The Percys beat the Scotch for him at Hamilton Hill, and then the king himself had to subdue them. The Orleanists in France invaded Guillaume ostensibly on Richard's behalf. Henry raised expeditions to face all this opposition, but Parliament refused to make adequate supplies, and hampered the king so that he could not give the kingdom that good governance which was the crying need of this century. It is difficult to feel any enthusiasm for the parliamentary victories of the period for this very reason. The assembly won rights of control, while what was really needed was a strong executive. The tale, however, must be told, and the principles which Parliament vindicated had their value as precedents in an age which was ripe for their application. Henry was forced to nominate his council in Parliament, and to agree to appropriation of supplies and audit of accounts. Another aspect of the reign was the emphasis of orthodoxy. 
archbishop arundel had helped henry to win the crown and in fourteen o one the statute de heretetico comparendo was passed which made death by fire the penalty for obstinate heresy the first to suffer was william sauter a lollard priest of london and several clerics and laymen were burnt during the reign yet the king had allowed the summary execution of archbishop scrope who had taken part in the northern rising the last years of henry's reign were more secure but he was dying of leprosy his son prince henry it was said had designs on his crown the court was divided by faction involving no principle henry died in march fourteen thirteen having drawn little satisfaction from the crown which he had won so questionably it is hard to feel any sympathy with him he seems to typify the sordid aspects of the age and even its spurious graces the king of twenty-five who ascended the english throne as henry v in fourteen thirteen has been pictured for us by an inimitable hand as the type of ideal manhood but history does not seal the verdict noted for his lightness and loose living as a prince on the day of his father's death he put these things away he was genuinely religious in a narrow way and he regarded his kingship as a sacred charge within his lights he never sullied it but his very righteousness is irritating because of his narrow vision and his crude assumptions he was not sordid but this was the shallowest of idealisms he was already in a stronger position than his father and his first parliament made him a generous grant it and the nation generally were enthusiastic for the french war which henry was to renew his orthodoxy too was pleasing to the nation henry the fourth had enforced the statute against heretics as languidly as he might and had never struck at the great ones who were tainted with lethargy but his son had a fierce hatred of heresy and immediately on his accession he attacked sir john oldcastle by courtesy lord cobham a notable lollard leader and a scholar when such among laymen were still rare he was condemned to be burnt but escaped and raised a forlorn revolt which was easily put down he was still at large till fourteen eighteen when he was captured and sent to the stake but the chief interest of the reign centres in the renewal of the french war the policy is almost the obvious one for henry to pursue in order to popularize the dynasty but this is a cynical motive which perhaps acted unconsciously he seems to have sincerely believed in edward the third's claim and in his own inheritance of it france was torn by feuds between the two great parties the armagnacs who had possession of charles the sixth the mad king and the burgundians henry landed in normandy in the summer of fourteen fourteen with a well-conceived plan of campaign meaning to reduce the duchy by a series of sieges pestilence broke out among his troops and after taking harfleur he marched for calais an immense armagnac army met him at agincourt on the twenty fifth of october and the famous battle was fought and won by the english in the traditional manner of crecci or portiers the archery doing vast execution against the heavy french cavalry and land which was but morass henry returned to england with immense prestige which was increased by his alliance with the emperor sigismund with the aim of putting an end to the great schism which had torn christendom since the return of the papal seat to rome in thirteen seventy eight the end was achieved when the council of constance elected pope martin v from fourteen seventeen to fourteen nineteen henry was again in france and conquered all normandy in the latter year the burgundians outraged by the murder of john duke of burgundy by the dauphin charles and the armagnac party formed an alliance with henry the burgundians were powerful in the north which alone accepted the treaty of troyes by which henry married catherine the french king's daughter and was recognized as regent and heir of the mad king there was fighting still to do in france and in may fourteen twenty one henry went a third time 
on the thirty first of august he died of dysentery at vincennes and in two months charles the mad king was dead too henry the sixth the son of henry and catherine was not two years old and power was divided out between his two uncles john duke of bedford and his younger brother humphrey duke of gloucester bedford was regent but to him fell the conduct of the war gloucester remained in england as protector though power really lay with the council the home history for twenty years while the king grew to his feeble manhood is merely the story of the quarrels between gloucester and the council and especially with henry beaufort bishop of winchester the last surviving son of john of gaunt gloucester was vain and factious while beaufort was a statesman and a patriot meanwhile bedford was doing his best to fulfil an impossible task and a generation of war leaders were being trained in the ruthlessness and violence which such a war begets and which were to mark the wars of the roses in the next generation bedford's effort to win the south of france from the king of bourges as the english derisively termed charles the seventh were made of no avail when in fourteen twenty nine joan of arc the peasant girl of doreme forced the english to raise the siege of orleans the key to the south and led charles the seventh to be crowned at rheims joan is the one heroic figure in an age of violence and treachery and she saved the fair land of france for which she had so great pity the english were demoralized by her prowess and the national spirit which she symbolized though she was captured and burnt at rouen the work she had done went on in fourteen thirty five the burgundians deserted the english and the death of bedford destroyed any further hope of victory in the next year charles the seventh recovered paris yet for some years longer the english kept a desperate grip on their conquests in the north and on guillaume the council hated the thoughts of peace and humphrey of gloucester was loud in his demands for war he however fell into insignificance with the disgrace of his wife eleanor of cobham in fourteen forty one for practising magic arts against the life of the young king beaufort with his nephew edmund beaufort duke of somerset and william de la pole earl of suffolk controlled the government and the truce of tours was signed in fourteen forty four henry who was weak to imbecility was married to margaret of anjou the next year a woman of remarkably strong character and lively temperament she immediately allied herself with somerset and suffolk and became involved in the odium which was the inevitable lot of those who made peace in a war which had begun so gloriously in fourteen forty seven anjou and maine were surrendered and gloucester appeared once more to head the discontent but was arrested and died in a few days perhaps by foul means normandy was reconquered by the french in retaliation for the sallies made by the garrisons somerset was in normandy and suffolk was made the victim of popular indignation he was impeached and banished but intercepted by his enemies on his way to flanders and murdered in the same month the popular sentiment found expression in a rebellion of the men of kent the hotbed of political agitation one john cade led it and terrorized london for two days but early history was repeated and the violence of the mob led to its dispersal by the men of london and cade was killed the rising was an indication of the strength of popular feeling it was significant that cade had used the name of mortimer the real representative of that house richard duke of york was lieutenant of ireland but left his post and arrived in england in fourteen fifty when somerset came back from france york assumed the position of leader of the opposition to the weak government of the court party which went rapidly from bad to worse henry gave and spent without counting and the want of good governance at home aggravated the sense of disaster abroad in fourteen fifty three guillaume was won by the french and nothing remained of the territory for which englishmen had fought for a century but calais in the same year henry went mad and at last margaret bore him a son edward 
parliament made richard protector of the realm and somerset was impeached and sent to the tower richard was occupying his natural position and there is no evidence that he aimed at the throne though the weakness of the lancastrian rule must have tempted reflections on his superior rights by descent from lionel duke of clarence richard seems to have been genuinely anxious for good governance and from one point of view the coming struggle is that of constitutionalism against misrule it is significant that the lancastrian party did without parliament for three years fearing to face it it was inevitable that richard when embittered by the lancastrian distrust of his aims should act as he did when in fourteen fifty five henry recovered and richard was dismissed and somerset restored richard marked with his retainers toward london and was met by troops under the king and somerset at st albans here was fought the first pitch battle of the wars of the roses somerset was slain and henry who would never strike blow against christian man taken prisoner richard's chief supporter was richard neville earl of warwick he could count besides his relatives the nevilles the mowbrays and the birchers a great band of noblemen some historians have seen in these wars no element but that of baronial jealousy and a certain color is given to the view by the nature of the strife the great mass of the people went on with their routine while the nobles fought pitched battles through their paid retainers largely soldiery whom the end of the french wars had turned loose upon the land it is significant that private feuds were fought out under the badges of the two roses and this particularism in aim gave a peculiar quality of bitterness to the struggle soon after st albans henry again went mad and york already in possession of the government was declared protector once more next year the king recovered and york remained two years out of office there was even a show of reconciliation in fourteen fifty eight but margaret was still bitter against him strife broke out again in fourteen fifty nine and in fourteen sixty york and his chief adherents fled the realm to return in 1460 taking henry prisoner once more while margaret fled york now claimed the throne and as a compromise was recognized as heir margaret tried to vindicate her son's rights and york was slain in battle against her at wakefield his son edward earl of march stepped into his father's position and pretensions and though margaret retained possession of her husband most pathetic figure at this time edward was recognized as king in london all the forces of order the towns and the richer parts of england the south and east held for him in dread of the lancastrian anarchy edward won the north in a series of battles beginning with towton margaret and her son fled to france and henry was taken and imprisoned in the tower for six years edward held the throne but his marriage to elizabeth woodville and the favor he showed her kinsmen alienated warwick and the nevilles warwick had set his heart on a french marriage for the king he showed his resentment by fomenting rebellions and enlisted the king's brother the duke of clarence who was bent on marriage with warwick's daughter edward was actually taken prisoner by the opposition in fourteen sixty nine but released on terms in the next year he hunted the rebels out of the country they returned within six months armed to effect a lancastrian revolution the south rallied to the earl and edward fled but to return in march fourteen seventy one with help from burgundy in april he took possession of london and put henry back in the tower within a fortnight warwick the kingmaker was slain at barnet and prince edward at tewkesbury margaret broken-hearted left england forever within a few weeks the unhappy henry was murdered in the tower for twelve years edward ruled england unopposed he was greedy but thrifty and he managed to live on his revenue and avoid taxation he extorted a vast sum of money from the french king at the treaty of pekinie being bought off from a war he never meant to wage 
he encouraged trade and ruled firmly through a small council of his wise relatives the country was desirous of rest otherwise edward's rule might have been resented for he was by no means a constitutional king for years he did not call parliament and he raised benevolences where he could he was by nature indolent and though handsome and popular by no means an heroic figure he murdered for more revenge his brother clarence whom one of his infrequent parliaments had attainted edward died at the age of forty-one having ruined his constitution by excess and slothful ease he had gradually delegated his duties to his brother richard of gloucester a hard-working man who had ever been zealous in his brother's cause nothing in his character or career pointed to undue ambition he easily obtained the protectorship in the person of the twelve-year-old king edward he imprisoned the queen's relatives and seized and beheaded without trial lord hastings the late king's greatest friend he got possession too of richard the younger brother of the young king and both were imprisoned in the tower he had himself crowned king of england declaring his brother's children bastards they were murdered within a month richard posed as a constitutional king and he counted on the support of a nation which he knew now dreaded civil war before all things but his crimes were too flagrant even for the england of that day he suppressed the rebellion of buckingham his chief supporter who shocked by the murder of the princess raised a revolt and was executed but all men were disgusted at the monstrous nature of richard's crimes as his wife anne neville lay dying it was rumoured that he was already scheming to marry his niece elizabeth sister of the princess whom he had murdered she was destined to be the bride of the man who overthrew him it was inevitable that henry earl of richmond the only representative of the house of lancaster should make a bid for the throne of england it was in his name that buckingham rose in fourteen eighty three he was the son of margaret buford and edmund tudor yorkist and lancastrian exiles rallied to his banner as he prepared for the invasion of england he landed on the first of august at milford haven and three weeks later slew richard on bosworth field the stanleys who had deserted richard on the field crowned henry tudor with the crown of the fallen king and so fittingly ended the final drama in the history of medieval england end of chapter six end of england in the middle ages by elizabeth o'neill